I went through a total of 42 placements from the time I was nine to the time I was 18. have officially passed the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act, also known as the AMMA law. They were absolutely not skulking around the street corner like um, some backstreet dealer. The area that they were in is such a huge gray area of the law. I'm looking at 15 very serious felonies. I'm assuming it's going to go real, real bad. haters made us famous or you know they hated us and did this awful stuff to our family we're still here they're still good after bad he's a survivor Chris has always been a survivor what I learned about him he won't give up All right, hey guys, we are back. Hopefully we started that show right. <clears throat> For some reason, my internet's either lagging or Facebook is really slow today. So we got it up, we're going over here. Welcome back, it is almost Christmas time. Can't wait to get this holiday done over with and uh, <laughs> this holiday cheer has been great this year. Uh, hopefully we have a great 2021 coming up, guys. We have a great show for you today, I'm really excited. We have Chris Martin on from uh, Haters Make Me Famous, the documentary that you can watch now on BMO. Um, it's an amazing documentary. Um, so much stuff going on with this thing. It really hit close to heart because I, I guess if you've ever been in the cannabis industry for a long time, you'll understand Chris's story right away. Uh, it's not, nothing new to our industry. It's something that we talk about all the time. It's something that we're trying to get rid of, the stigmas, and get people out of jail. Um, let's get people's lives back on track. Uh, the, 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 the war on on all drugs has been kind of crazy, especially with cannabis. Um, so we're going to get the show rolling. We're going to talk to Chris. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to all my co-hosts who are joining us again today. We have Thomas Markholm of Vermont Grow Coaching. Thomas, again, Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays. How's it going, Joe? Good. Welcome back. Merry Chris. Christmas, Joe. Another fun week. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have Timothy Fair from Vermont Grow, Co uh, Vermont Grow Coaching. Vermont Canvas Solutions, our, our legal team here on in the weeds. Uh, Timothy, going, happy Joe. holidays to you as well. Um, and we have Nurse Sherry on with us as well from the Green Nurse Group. Uh, she'll be on with us a little bit later doing their segment as well. I uh, cannot talk. Um, and happy holidays to you as well. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for having us on. Hey, we're really excited to have you back. Um, it's been a it's been a great addition to the show so far. Um, don't mind me, guys. I think we're all a little tired, wiped out, and just getting ready for this holiday season, right? Um, first and foremost, though, we have a, a great special guest. I'm really excited to have him on. Um, I caught a glimpse of this documentary a few weeks ago, and I was like, I have to talk to this guy. Um, it really, like I said, it hit home to me growing up, you know, outside of Boston, being in that whole scene, that whole element. Um, and I have many friends that can really relate to what happened. You know what I mean? We talk about it all the time on the show. We bring up these these topics. We bring up these issues. Um, and Chris has literally lived through it. You know, he spent you know, eight years incarcerated over cannabis, right? Um, and then on top of that story, he's turned into a success, right? He's, he's, he's come out of prison, he's served the time, and now he's turned it into a positive thing. We're still in the industry and killing it, honestly, guys. So uh, first and foremost, I want to introduce Chris Martin. Chris, uh, tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and how the hell did you end up in cannabis, man? 
Hey guys, I'm uh, I'm Chris Martin. Um, I got into cannabis just like everybody else did. My dad was hiding it in the attic. Um, I mean, I thought weed was normal. I didn't think much of it. Um, my, you know, if you got sick in my house as a kid, you took mommy's elixir or put the mommy's burn cream on your arm. <laughs> you know? So for us, it was it was always medicine. I think that's probably why my childhood wasn't as rough as it did. You know, going into the foster homes and the group homes and stuff because. Uh, the state and the government didn't see that as, as being okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, definitely not. <laughs> when I first got uh, when I first got involved out here in Arizona, though, I came out here to play baseball. I got recruited out of uh, Kansas when I first left the the group homes. I was an athlete, got recruited to Yavapai, which is a junior college out here that um, was a pretty predominant baseball program. Um, I had never heard of them, but I was pretty blessed to come out and play for a good team for once that wasn't in a little crappy town in Kansas somewhere. And uh, when I got here three months later, I had been caught with a joint and uh, was looking at three years in prison. So that's kind of what started my whole trail at 18 years old. I mean, I, I always thought growing up in Kansas was going to be the worst part of my story of being with pot you know getting caught with pot and here i am moving out to arizona going to prison for it um literally yeah. within three months of my college career in in baseball i had a i got caught with a joint in my top drawer um i had a roommate who drank a little bit more than most and got a lot of attention for it we had the campus police come bang on the door they found a joint in my top drawer and the rest was over from that point i was in uh <laughs> looking at a uh, three to five well, i mean we all know arizona is not lenient on cannabis by any means They're, they have some of the strictest laws in the country right that's arizona as i found out uh i think the the probably the saving grace of my story is i was just a white guy in a country boy town <laughs> if it was anything other i i wouldn't be on this show telling this story right now because the the laws here are pretty archaic and as we're all learning, it's uh, corporatizing from one state to the next. So if you're not getting beat up on a social equity side, then you're going to get beat up on the corporate side. So it's a it's interesting to see the dynamic and how it's evolved. You know, I tell everyone I had the luxury, quote unquote, of going to prison and being involved in this industry within two different decades. Uh, when I went down the first time. You know, it was about reform. It was about rehabilitate. You were actually, you know, trying to go to a program or had a class or a job or something that actually supported you going home as a better human being than when you went in. When I went to prison on this last charge, you know, with the edibles and, and, and the reason for my book and my story, it's not about reform and rehabilitate. It's about recidivism. Um, hmm. you, there's 300 guys in a warehouse fighting over four toilets now without programs, without anything other than really cheap heroin so to see mm -hmm. how it's evolved one direction considering that we can deem a plan essential in so many ways yet not let anyone out of jail it just it's it's maddening and that's why i wrote the book and that's why i launched the doco right i mean like you said it all started over a joint right it wasn't like yeah. you even cost it was just something that they found um right. and then obviously you're in well, college I'm not right I won't tell too many lies about it. I mean, I was selling pot. They caught yeah. me doing. So yeah. the fact that they were on me, they were trying to catch me doing what I was doing. I mean, I wasn't an angel sitting there only smoking weed. I, I was a 19 year old kid trying to put new shoes on my feet too. I, I'm not even going to lie about it. Um, so it was a blessing that the, I got caught for the joint. They found the, if they would have found the 11 pounds I had in the bathroom, I probably would have gotten way more than three years but because of <laughs> childhood and where i came from that was really the only way i knew how to support myself it was the only way i knew mm -hmm. how to to even get involved it wasn't until 2007 when i found out i had crohn's uh was when i really started researching the medicinal side no yeah. so that, that was it for you i mean that one of our biggest questions from every guest on here is like we said how wh where does it change for you a how do you get into cannabis and b where did it make that mark for you to change from because i mean a lot of us are in the same position as you we we were in high school we we all hustled weed just to have a side hustle make some money smoke our weed you know what i mean that's why the story really hits home i think with a lot of people because if you think about people our age you know, 20 years ago, like you said, smoking a joint, you 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 can go to jail, you get busted. It's it's, it's an offense in every state. 
I got to tell you, it changed for me when, when, on the second stint in prison um, because mm. I kept thinking like, you know, you, you make the same, it, it's that definition of insanity. Keep making those <laughs> same decisions, get the same result. And I could not figure out why in the world that no matter what I did with this plant, I was still ending up in prison. Even when I went the caregiver route and said, you know what, I'll donate everything. We're, we'll make this thing happen. And uh, next thing you know, I'm looking at 127 years with criminal syndication charges and i did more help and more you know soul work than i did anything um it, it was mind-blowing to see how quickly things got stacked and gang charges get thrown in because you ride in a club or you know it just shows the bureaucracy behind these man minimum mandatory laws and you know, I mean, I hadn't been in trouble in 22 years. Now, all of a sudden, I fall under a minimum mandatory. Like, that's okay. Why? Because I wear a patch? Um, mm -hmm. Well, so, so do cops. <laughs> well, the big, the big problem is, 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 is getting caught more than once, right? Like, especially in most systems, it's that second charge, maybe a third charge that really nails you. You know, we're hearing and we see articles all the time now about people getting released from prison because of, you know, obviously COVID or time running out. Um, especially with these new decriminalization laws in, in different states, looking at that different, uh, which is huge. I mean, obviously, you, you serve some time, a couple different times now for, like you said, just trying to, to, to serve with a plant. Um, what was the court system like in Arizona? Now, all these charges were placed in Arizona State, right? Right. Yeah, they were. They, they were trying to reco me. They wanted to go fed because of the club, and uh, they wanted mm -hmm. to tie all Together, but when they realized that the cops that raided me and every single, I mean, we're talking from the chief of Prescott police, the chief of Prescott Valley police, the head of Pan at that time, they all were officer members of their own motorcycle club. So all of a sudden the feds didn't want to come in anymore. They backed up like, wait, oh, hold on. Um, because look, if I'm going to look at life, we're going to go in there. We're going to actually fight. We're going to fight back and show like why I shouldn't be looking at life. And when we did that, we dug up so much dirt, uh, Brady list, lying to grand jury, planting evidence. I mean, you name it, it, it all came out. Next thing you know, they throw a two year plea bargain at me. And literally I picked up the plea bargain and I threw it back. I'm like, what? For one, I'm standing here because of a snitch. Like there's a guy, a guy that signed a sealed deal in my case. He was actually, pardon me. No, sorry. Yeah, he was stealing our chocolate. So um, he, he came in as an investor, started taking product out the back door, telling us that he was going to consign it on terms to all the new dispensaries as they open. And when no money came in, we all have questions. I have bills to pay. I have staff to pay. I want to know where the money's at. And within four days of my questioning, I'm getting raided. I'm literally driving my kids to school and I got a, a trail of cops following me all the way to my kid's school. And I find out at that moment that our partner was a rat. He, he got caught selling the candy that he was stealing to the police on camera. And instead of him doing time for it, he went in there and said, oh, the owner told me to do it. And me and my wife had no clue. I had no idea this dude was even stealing from me. Next thing I know, I'm in a, a case fighting for my life looking at 100 plus years because i'm a gang member and uh it all all of it started to come out as soon as we hired that the private investigator ak it all showed its head that wait a minute i'm not the bad guy here i just got caught in a really crappy situation in between two really bad entities and uh, i think that's mm -hmm. what happens a lot of times and someone has to be the scapegoat and without that voice to fight back they end up doing life like delisi and like you know, look at all the time everyone's getting, you know, having to do before they're getting commuted. It's crazy. I, yep. To think that I was one one day away from being one of those, it's scary. That's why I will fight until everyone comes home now. So oh, sorry, I got to go through no. that, Chris. Just so sorry. No, it's horrible. So, so you're in court now. You're facing, you know, 120 plus years, right? Where, where did that case change for you? I mean, obviously, you didn't face 120 years um what evidence was brought in to change all that for you well it all started way back right after the raid so i owned a small restaurant called rustica bistro and wine bar just a little italian 200 label wine bar that i opened in prescott valley 
I had a patron guy that used to come in. I won't mention his name. He asked us not to mention him even in the doco, but he came in and was a regular. He, he always came in and ate. Well, I could tell he was military or police or something. He had some type of affiliation, but we never spoke about it. Kind of like my club, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't his business and it wasn't my business. All I knew is he liked my, my tortellinis and, and he came in and he ate. So we fed him. Uh, when I After the raid, my wife and I were separated in jail and I happened to be walking into court and I saw my wife in the same room. So I'm getting in trouble by the judge and the bailiff because I'm talking to my wife and we're co-defendants and technically we're not allowed to have any type of correspondence. I haven't seen her in eight days. All I want to do is give her a hug. All of a sudden, the gentleman from my restaurant comes up and he puts his business card on my shoulder. And when I saw him, my first response was embarrassment. Like, oh, man, this guy just saw me in jail and my wife. And then I read the card and was like private investigator. And he goes, you're going to need that. Call me when you get home. And uh, I was bailed out a few days later. And when I did, I called him. Um, the guy had been a, a prior sheriff for quite a while and got burned out of his pension due to an injury. And because mm -hmm. he chose to have an injury fixed, he lost everything, which that set him off. He, he invested his life into his job. And now... He wants to expose. He wants to, to kind of get them back, I guess you could say. He had so much dirt that he handed me. My 127-year deal, as soon as we walked in with all the dirt that he handed me, I was handed a two-year plea bargain. So I would have to say that would be the biggest U-turn in the entire case is when I didn't hire some defense attorney who's sleeping with the judge anyway. I hired a private investigator oh. to fight them the way they fight me. Hey, no offense, no offense, my <laughs> oh, no, no, no offense taken. Um, sure luckily, we're not we're not live on air right now, so it's great. Um, no, I mean the, the judicial system is a mess, right? I mean we talk about this a lot. Uh, it's who you know, how you know, uh, what side of team you're really on. Like you said, it's it's you, we're we're all in these clubs and you're doing the same thing. It's just we're doing it against each other, and it's the police versus whoever is in their way, I guess, right? There's an article that came out in June, I, I want to say 2016, it might even be earlier than that, but it was out of the examiner.com and it was called, the article was by a local uh, publisher up there or a local, you know, uh, reporter up there and it's called nepotism cronyism in a small town courtroom and it specifically mentions and talks about the court that I was in and it talks about the 16 different relationships between husband and wife and mother daughter son and all the different relationships and just that one little courthouse um and some of the experiences because of that so uh, it, there's definitely some you know other cases that have been on dateline and other things that have been brought up in that county so I, this is not new news this is a surprise look what we found it's just the fact that people are listening now and actually go, wait a minute, you can't do that. <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing is nobody was watching before. Right. Well, I mean, it's the war on drugs per perpetrated by the, the war on drugs, right? Perpetuated by the war on drugs. So it's like it comes from the top, really. I mean, it, it's not much that you're doing, but being the uh, the target at some point, right? Uh, between being ratted out and just like you said, having a, a trail of hey, we can get this guy. I mean, I think we see that too much. And that's why we see a lot with like the racisms and stuff like that, because they know they can get these people. You know what I mean? They know they can pull off a charge. They know they can fuck with them. They know they can just ruin their lives. And they go back and laugh about this, which is really uh, the unfair part of our judicial system right now, especially the way it is. And why it's so important that we talk about and see all these states that are legalized and get people out of jail. You know what I mean? Let's 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 look at this. Let's talk about that. How do we how do we help people that we've incarcerated for X amount of years? You know what I mean? How do we help out Chris Martin get back on his feet? How do we help out the people that, like you said, you know, we got a bunch of these guys getting, you know, Debassi's getting, you know, coming out now. Uh, we got all these guys are getting taken out, whether it's COVID or end of sentence relations. But um, we really have to talk about reform. I mean, it's not only just giving these people their lives back, but it's about reforms that you know the way we're living now tim we're still arresting people aren't we i mean we talk every about day. cases now every day and you, you know, know I mean? just, arizona you know especially what was this about eight nine years ago if i remember right chris almost a decade ago it's just a nightmare i mean you know it was might as well been you know trafficking heroin across the border for what they cared about you know a little bit of weed 
I, yeah, I mean, you fed my charges. If it looked like I was a meth lab dealing trafficker <laughs> gang member, if you read that stuff, you would let me fly a kite in the park with your kid. I mean, like I read it and went, whoa, man, my kids are not going to talk to me anymore. I had more child endangerment charges than I did drug charges. I was like, are you kidding me? It's a candy it's bar. Absolutely like, insane. Slow down. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Chris. Just so cool. right? it, Honestly, I, I felt like if we didn't keep fighting and if we didn't do, you know, like when I went to prison the first time, you're a youngster. You, you don't know. You're a knucklehead. You don't know that your ass from the hole in the ground. You just want to get home. When I went to prison this time and saw the differences in prison versus what it was like with programming before, I realized that this story had nothing to do with me and chocolate. This story is a lot bigger. It's it's all about reform. It's all about, you know, when, when, a, when a greedy corporation can step up and say, this is an essential medicine. We need it even through COVID, open the door, sell as much as you can, but we don't let anybody out of jail, but maybe 12 people a year. It's bullshit. The gig is up. Let these people come home and not only let them come home, but let them come home with a piece of the pie. They laid their lives down on the fucking line to be where they're at right now and to keep, continually keep getting kicked. You know how many people I've had on my own podcast that are in prison next to a pot field for pot? Yep. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sick of it. I don't mean to tell so, you guys, but woo. this is custom. I'm gonna pipe just in. Just wait till they start having them uh, grow hemp in prison. Just make it a part of a program. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. Have uh, I mean, obviously, when when you went, Chris, this was you know quite a few years ago now when you were dealing with these troubles, right? Um, now, how much was your total time served there in prison? Um, I was sentenced to the first time three years. I did. A year in county, which I didn't get credit for. I did three in prison, plus my four-year tail when I came home. So I had eight years on the first time. And then this time I went when I got rated in 12, I didn't get sentenced till the end of 15. I was sentenced to two years, but I was told I would only have a four-year tail when I came out and I could apply for early release. But what I've since learned is that because I'm STG'd or security threat grouped as a gang member, I don't qualify for early term, even though I've completed all my, my probation requirements, I paid all my money and fees and fines. My probation officer here in Maricopa County loves me. She, she was ready to cut me loose two years ago, but because I'm being held on to and babysat by Maricopa for the county that sentenced me, I have to allow them to release me and I'm due to be released February 21st. Um, that's my end date where they can't really keep me any longer, but you know, um, we're knocking on wood right now. So we'll see what happens. So, so I, wanna... hurts, I can, uh, I, I can tell you, you know, the, the game is, is definitely rigged. That's, that's for sure. And uh, I, I watched your documentary this, this weekend. And from what I uh, watched about, you know, how, how they took you down and, took your wife down uh, right in front of your kids, you know, rammed you off the road, put guns in front of your kids' faces and stuff. You know, that's just, that's, that's not okay. Um, when it comes down to it, they were the ones that put your children in danger, not you. They should be the ones with child endangerment charges against them, not you. A candy bar is a candy bar. If you're providing uh, cannabis as a medicine to patients, you're not endangering your children, especially if you're properly educating your children at the same time. Yes. But after a two year investigation, you can't tell me that you don't know what we're about. I've, I've never killed anybody, shot at anyone. I, I, you don't even have assault charges on me. So like, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> Coming to my house 35 deep in tanks and shit anyway. Um, and, and, they, and they can't, they, they can't say, you know, uh, that they couldn't have got you another time. They knew where you were going. They knew you were bringing your kids to school. They could have waited until you dropped your kids off and not done it in front of them. They did that on purpose. And well, here's the issue I have. I'm going to pipe right in here from as a, from a nursing perspective. Trauma. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. They traumatized your children. They traumatized you. They traumatized your wife. And they're contributing to the trauma, the complex PTSD, the PTSD that people are seeing across the country. How mm -hmm. this is absurd. So what they're doing is they're not contributing to the solution. They're contributing to the problem. And mental health is so, so important. It is something that we don't address. If we get lucky enough, I mean, you think about the traditional system, what do we focus on? Body parts, 
symptoms, disease processes. Mm -hmm. And if we're lucky, we get to mental, emotional, psychological health, and rarely do we ever get to spiritual health. So this is where we really need to stop and think, how are we contributing to the solution? And if we're not, right. got to pull back, because this is huge. We're experiencing so much trauma, even right now. And I hear your story, and I watched, and I literally, like, I almost threw up, <laughs> because I'm like, this is, you know, creating mental health disorders through mm -hmm. not properly taking care of what needs to be taken care of. And it's through education. It's huge. Well, that's, why, huge. that's why I felt like the book and the movie were mandatory, not, not for profitability or marketability or even brand ability. It was all about my family healing. What people mm -hmm. don't understand or they forget is that when those cops go home, they don't have that trouble of worrying about their eight-year-old not ever sleeping on his bed again because he will not. He's 16 now, and he's been homeschooled ever since because if I leave him in a school, he panics that I'm not going to come home from prison or a raid while he's not there. I can't. This is eight years later. I'm still dealing with this stuff, and so is he. And I'm not putting him on psych meds. I'm not putting him on bullshit isotropics or whatever else they want to pump him full of because mm -hmm. my plant is too dangerous for him because it's on a schedule one. Well, go fuck yourself. That's all I'm gonna say about it because I'm the one that deals with that little dude when the cops roll past us with their sirens blaring and he hits the floor in tears. I'm done mm -hmm. with it. The yeah. Family that go through that I, I, all i do is try to help them because i know that pain i know that feeling i owned a fifteen thousand square foot grow a, a year after i got out of prison we had the cops jump the fence and come in and raid us because supposedly i bought equipment from a gentleman who was using it illegal i had no idea who the gentleman even was the cops were following him I just happen to have a magnet of bullshit in my pocket that attracts this shit. So I'm sitting here at my office watching the, cat. the cops are jumping my fence and my growers are calling me panicking going, hey, the cops are, no one got arrested. They just wanted the equipment because of the guy they were watching. Now, mind you, my wife and my children were sitting here at my hemp store watching. As soon as we seen what happened, my kids were underneath my desk. My wife was in tears. My daughter was shaking and ready to throw up all because of what, what we've already been through. I'm so afraid to even get pulled over with my kids in the car, not because of what I will do, not because, because of what they're going to feel, what they might go through, all because of what? A candy yeah. Candy bar. I mean, unfortunately, this is something that we see way too much with police officers lately. Tim can tell us many stories about doors getting kicked in. I had my door kicked in about a year ago over a traffic warrant for missing court. Literally kicked in my, my kids, the same thing. Chris, it's just like you said, it's a candy bar. It's something that's not like your kids don't even see the problem here because it, it's not something that's so almost innocent in, in, a, in a sense. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's crazy though, but what it did do is it instilled so much passion in my family. Half my kids are mm -hmm. DH members now. They produce the product out of the dispensary for me or they're advocates in other ways. I mean, my son who's 16 is the CEO of our pet company, which over the last 12 months has become the top four what top four or five products out of 10 in my store so mm -hmm. like the resilience it's built on the other hand you know i want people to recognize the ptsd and i want them to understand that trauma exactly like you said that's why we did this but i also want them to see the good side of what's come out of it because all it did was like you said too is it educated them they're like wait so, a minute dad they did this to you all, all of us for that that's yeah. what? so this yeah. is this is so here it is right so what you've done is you've been able to turn it around into something good. Mm -hmm. That's called post-traumatic growth, right? So you took, you took what you could, you started to heal, you're working with your family, you're continuing to build your company and your business and your brand and helping people and helping patients. And so that does build resiliency and you coming out, you're going to save someone else's life with your book, with your documentary, truly going to save someone else's life. And that's truly what it's all about. It's about living your best life and helping other people do the same. So really, that, I'm, you know, thank you for I, coming I forward and sharing that, your story. And I attribute that to, even though growing up in a group homes and foster homes and those situations, I attribute that to people like Casa and people like 
like the volunteers who step up for kids in those situations. So that's exactly how this whole thing comes back full circle. I mean, when, when I was a kid in the group homes, I mean, a group homes suck. You're fighting all the time. I was there 10 years. They're miserable. It's, it's worse than prison because in prison, at least you know what you're walking into. And, and there, everyone's a man. You know what I mean? Like everyone can fight for themselves. As a boy, when you're nine with 17-year-olds, it's a whole other story. It's, it's, it's a whole other bureaucracy than what I, I was used to. And if it wasn't for CASA, I had a CASA worker who came in and, and got involved. He saved my life. He, he saved my case. He was the guy that would go in front of the judge and say, hey, look, this is a child in need of care. He needs to be in a foster home, not a level five boys home. Because most of the time, it doesn't matter. If there's an empty bed, you're going to get it. That's where you're going to go. And, and the sad part is, is wherever you land is usually what determines how you turn out. You know, if you end up in a lockup at a young age, you're going to come out a bad mofo. You know what I mean? If, if you get a nice, fluffy foster home with a puppy, you're going to come out this cool kid, supposedly. I mean, I guess that's the idea behind the thing. Without CASA, it wouldn't have mattered. Without CASA or someone who volunteered their time to go in front of a judge and, and talk about the system. Um, so the, the best part of the whole story is when I went back to start filming my documentary, I hadn't spoke to my CASA in 26 years. And if you've seen the documentary, that's David Alvarado. That's the big Danny DeVito looking Mexican guy in there that uh, he's funny as hell. Uh, when, when we first met, he just tried to reach out as an adult in the system, trying to befriend me. And at the age he came around, I wasn't having it. I wasn't trying to make more adult friends from the system. And plus his blonde jokes were garbage. So I, I really didn't think he was even funny when he approached me, but he was persistent. He wouldn't stop. And then he shows up and he would take me away from the group home for the day and just refocus me. And I tell you, if you've seen uh, like Goodwill Hunting, he was my Robin Williams. I swear he was the guy that would just keep, you know, telling me it's not my fault keep your head up you need to move forward he would show up at all my football games and and film all my my games and write my stats down sending them to colleges I mean, he's the only reason i made it to yavapai i'd never heard of that place before um it was dave so when we went out to film the doc and reconnected after 26 years we had so much stuff to catch up on obviously um, one of the unique things he shared with me is that he went off to be a chocolatier with russell stovers for almost 12 years so yes. when we shared why I went to prison as a chocolatier for cannabis, he was like, oh, my God, I've never put weed in it. Would you show me? And I was blown away because this is the guy say no to drugs, their program advocate. Like, you know, he was he was doing the best for, for what Casa wanted him to do. But once he saw my passion and he saw that I have Crohn's, this is the only thing keeping me alive and off Humera, he, he was all in. So I had the opportunity to fly him home out here with us for a year and he helped me relaunch Zonka the brand I went to prison for last January and mm -hmm. uh, he killed it for us he it was so full circle I, I I can't even make this stuff up no it's uh and your brand people know too Zonka bars I mean we all know this brand I mean you talk about brands and man you, you, in the last five minutes you talked about clothing dog food um hemp lines um you know i'm reading all the notes i got and all the stuff that we've been interacting on i mean man you, you have your family's involved which is amazing which for me i have an eight-year-old son as, as everybody watches the show knows my son knows as much as anybody sitting on the show really um is i love watching him correct people when you call him marijuana he goes off on you it's not it's this is medicine this is cannabis so it has, show some respect you know what i mean and this is an eight-year-old kid so it blows my mind a lot of people, I want a lot of people to think about, though, and in this current situation, this, hap this has happened to Chris, and this has happened to hundreds of people, if not thousands of people across the country in the last 20 years. And up until the last four or five years, what I don't think is anybody realizes the, how deep it went. You know what I mean? We're starting to watch these shows, Narcos. We're starting to hear stories like yours, Chris, right? We're starting to be able to actually get information from these guys who've been behind bars for 60 years for selling weed. You know what I mean? it wasn't accessible to us before right so now laws are changing people are becoming more aware of our situations uh we see the support in our country you know up over 70 percent for cannabis legalization right um so it's a, it's a different world now 
what when did you wake up and decide to write the book right because you 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 have the chris martin story right one life yes yeah i wrote the book so started i wrote the book in jail so Mm -hmm. i was looking at a lot of time and there were a lot of things being thrown around about gang member and stg and you know when all that stuff comes out in the news or the media or whatever your kids start asking a lot of questions and their friends start asking a lot of questions i coach football i've coached all my kids from my 23 year old down you know like i've paid taxes i've owned businesses i've been a chef in a lot of places so it's not like i'm some you know one percenter crawling out from underneath the rock doing dirt or something i I, I, my club was a veteran club that raised money for multiple different, you know, people. So it was just, it was, it was a situation where I felt like I'm in jail. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. And if I do go to jail for life, then I don't have a chance to explain it to my family. I don't have a chance to tell my six year old, Hey, I'm not a piece of shit. I'm going to have to try to do that from behind bars. And Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the balls to do that, quite frankly. You know what I mean? So when you go to jail and you're SDG as a gang member, they they put you in a little hole. They, you don't get to go to G, G, um, GP with everyone else. And they usually segregate you with other gang members. So I was segregated with a young MS-13 member, which is pretty rare considering jail. They, they tend to segregate you according to your race as well. Um, mm. I felt like they did it a little on purpose just to see what would happen. Maybe he was young, a younger guy. I'm an older guy. I'm a white guy, biker. He's a a younger Mexican gang member. You know, maybe they just want to see what happens. I don't know. The kid was a good kid. Um, I, I, it was sad. His circumstance comes from bad childhood drugs, you know, the typical starting of a gang member gang comes in and saves him. And now he wants out, but he's addicted to heroin and he can't get away. So, as we're sharing our stories back and forth, I really felt for the kid. I was just like, geez, man, this is, huh. this is why I joined the club. So I could stay away from people and, and situations that would have this as the ending. Um, so as I'm telling him my story, he's looking at me and he calls me OG. He's like, hey, OG, why don't you write that down? Like, put it on paper. And, and you know, it's such a crazy story. I, I, don't, I think people would love to read it. And I'm like, this 23-year-old gang member up here is telling me to write a book. That's, that's funny. So I thought about it. And I started writing, just taking notes and listening. The problem was, is I can't get paper and pencil in the jail because the, the Mexican guards don't want to deal with me. Like, I'm a white guy. So yeah. luckily, I got an essay next to me. And I could ask him, like, could you give me paper and give me pencil and you know, like I'll, whatever you need, I'll have my family call yours and make sure they're okay or whatever. So we would trade stuff and he would get me paper and pencil. Well, one day the, the Mexican guy that my roomie, he's out of the cell going to medical and the, one of the guards goes by and I had my pencil sitting outside to get sharpened in my soapbox and this guy just kicks him across the floor. And I'm like, you dirtbag, like all I want to do is write. Like I'm not trying to mess with nobody. So I said something to him when he went by and he ignored me, comes back, talks trash. It's just his argument. So when the youngster gets back in the cell, I told him what happened. I'm like, hey, do you think you could get my pencils for me? And he comes back. The cop has me come up to the door and he's yelling at me like, why do you need all these pencils? Why do you need all this paper? Just just jamming me real hard. And I'm like, look, man, I'm writing my life story. And he's like, I bet you are. And just just giving me a ration of shit. Well, he finally and comes back. I get the paper. The I get the pencil. Yeah, yeah. I, I get the paper all over a, a, a box of golf pencils. Like, really? I mean, I told you the bureaucracies are so different in there. Well, I finally get the pencil and the paper. I, I, as I keep writing, um, I, the kid is just really involved with me reading it to him. Like, he wants to know what the next chapters are. So I'm almost pressured to keep writing. Um, I within the eight day period of being in the cell with this kid, I finally got rolled up for prison and they come in and they tell you, Martin, roll up your stuff. You're going to DOC. But that usually means within like 24 hours, you're going to go. So I had to rock and get all this stuff done while I'm reading it to him. And he's helping me, you know, Oh no, don't say that. Say this. And we're, we're going through it all. And at the end of the day, the same Mexican guy who was giving me this whole hard time, he comes up to me and he tells me, you know, you roll your stuff up put it out the door, we'll, we'll come get you. 
I go to the bean shoot that had them all three huge envelopes of 30 chapters or whatever this was handwritten. And when he grabs it out the bean shoot, we looked at each other like eye to eye. I mean, we're literally as close as we are on the phone right now. And he looked at me like, this kid did write his life story. And I'm thinking, yeah, your dumb ass has to read it before you let me out of here too, if you're you know, really doing your security work. So I'm laughing, thinking he's gonna read this whole 300 pages, but knowing he probably won't. About 12 or 14 hours later, when they rolled me up, um, I'm outside the cell and the little guy's waving at me saying, thank you. And you know, we had a cool little connection. When he belly chains me, he asked me to lift the leg and he clicks my ankle chain and he says, damn good book, son. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, excuse me? And he hooked my other leg, didn't respond and moved on to the next guy and started wrapping him up. And I just sat there. And right there at that moment, I realized that, you know, this, this is going to be a little bigger than me just writing a note home to my kids or this is going to be a little bit bigger than that. It just, it, it, it kind of verified a lot of the path that I was about to walk. I mean, this was before my testimony. This was before I had a lot of other stuff happen that you'll read about in the book or see in the doco. But this was just kind of one more stepping stone. Let me know, like, it's, it's going to get shitty before it gets better. But there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Right. No, definitely. I mean, again, you, 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 <laughs> it's amazing when you, when you think about it, it's like, oh, this, this, this young gang member just inspired me one day to write a book and look where it's led to. Now you, you have the Chris Martin story, right? Um, you have the video, you have a podcast too. So you actually taken all this stuff. And like you said, you, you touched on it before, but I want to make sure you, you, you touch on it again. You have a haters make me famous podcast, right? Where you, you're bringing on guests that have actually been through the same, same thing you have, right? Yeah, the, the podcast started really just to give other people a voice because I remember when I was fighting my case and I was on all the podcasts trying to talk and get help. Uh, I was on a podcast with Richard DeLisi and we were on the Human Solution International. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember hearing his story and knowing my fight and that I was looking at the same amount of time and watching a young guy get old in there and, and everything he had been through. And and man, when, when you see the path that's laid in front of you, not only do you have no choice but to respect it, but you fear it. I mean, you mm. honestly, you're looking into the eyes of death. It's the first time I've ever compared my circumstances to one of my stage four terminal patients, you know, when they mm. come to you and tell you what situation they're in and you both know the end result. I mean, I would never, ever say that prison was anything like a, a cancer, you know, dying of it. But I will tell you that feeling of hopelessness or that feeling of not not having a, a good ending was pretty comparable, at least to what, you know, on, on my end. So we felt like the podcast was the best way to to give back and give those people a voice and come on and talk about it. And I mean, my last guest on season two was Weldon Angelos. And look at yeah. Weldon now. Weldon got a full pardon from the Trump administration yesterday. And I mean, just even being a small part of that, knowing that I know that guy. And that guy actually walks the walk and talks the talk and makes it happen not only for him, but for how many others. And look at what he went through. That guy sat in prison for how long? Uh, I mean, yeah. those are inspirational oh, people to me and my family. <laughs> they inspire us so it just makes me work harder that's why there's 600 presents in the room behind me getting delivered tomorrow to 50 different foster homes and we fed 200 kids on thanksgiving with the nonprofit. and we've never felt more fulfilled on a holiday than we have being able to help others and i mean that with all sincerity no, no man you're killing it i mean again the Hempful Chef, right? It's a, it's a moniker that people call you, right? Uh, you got Convicted Creations. Um, you're doing tons of charitable work. Talk about Convicted Creations. I mean, this is, again, all these things keep spurring off of all this stuff, right? You know, Convicted Creations started off as a joke. I'm going to be really <laughs> honest about it. Um, a, a dear friend of mine who passed away a couple of years ago, um, I met him in prison. His name was Irish, a really good friend of mine, Billy McMaster. We met because he was a Denver Broncos fan. And if anyone knows me, I'm from Kansas. I'm a huge Chiefs fan. Um, Denver Chiefs don't like each other. So I'm unpacking my stuff on a prison yard. And this guy walks up, kicks my bed, holds up a Denver flag and says, you and I can't be friends. And I'm like, I laugh in one aspect and the other aspect is like, get the fuck out of here, you 
fucking Broncos fan. But no, really, he's just a good guy. He's really funny. Um, and we ended up being really good friends to where, you know, when I was having a bad day, he was the guy that would walk me around the track and get my head up. And uh, when, when we were in prison, part of our routine was to try to avoid the chow hall. Uh, usually when when wars jump off or bad things happen, it's usually in there. It's where all the people are. And not to mention the food is garbage. So the, what's the point of really going there? So I would mm -hmm. take the commissary list and I would make recipes from the commissary list, taking old recipes that you know you learn in there and making my own from it. Well, Billy's idea was, you know, why don't you write a, a cookbook? You're a chef, you've gone to restaurants, you've done all this stuff, and why don't you present it as a cookbook one day? And we laughed and joked about it. Like, who in the hell would buy it? Like, no, nobody wants to eat ice cream in the dryer made out of coffee creamer. Like, this is not normal. We do it because we're forced to do it. Um, but once, what, you know, when I came home, uh, Billy passed away on a motorcycle in a motorcycle accident. And uh, if you notice on the inside of my book, One Life, I dedicated it to him and his daughter because I feel like he's the reason I made it home from prison. Uh, he kept me balanced, you know. And then when I gave him work, he wanted a bike. We helped him pay for the bike. And then seven days later, he got hit on it and uh, we lost him. So I felt like my promise to him for the cookbook um, was mandatory. So mm. when I wrote the cookbook, we launched it and it still was a joke. It was still one of those things where, ha ha ha, tamales out of Doritos. That's funny. That's cool. But um, it turned out to become a way for me to let other inmates coming home work on projects. So they helped me develop it. They helped me author it. Um, I bring inmates when they come home and I put them on the set and their stories go in the book. So they actually become an author and have material that they can share and they actually can get an IMDB because now they're on my show. So it's kind of just showing them a whole nother life that they would know nothing. Or I knew nothing about that. I get to share with them and, and it, it, it's pretty neat, but then it, it, it grows from there because we share our experiences. We're counseling each other through it. We're really walking each other through a crappy situation that we get to laugh about later and, and joke mm. about. But you know how many people have called me and been like, look, man, I'm looking at five years and I've never been to jail and I have no clue what to look for. And now they, they have a book that they can read. And, and mm. you know, by no means do we ever want to capitalize on that. So all the proceeds go to the nonprofit. We don't take money from any of that stuff. That money goes back into putting stamps on letters to write people and put money on their books. So it's, it's really just a full circle thing that I promised a guy in jail and I'm about keeping my word. And now I see why it all makes sense to me. Why? Because there is a lot more people that this was about than just me and my family. No, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, for you to come on and, and, and just embark on all these projects and provide this for other inmates and just know what they're going through and help them ease back into it. It's a great, it's a great idea, man. As a chef myself, I get a big kick out of your story because it's like, it's everywhere and I love it. Um, I mean, a lot of people, like we said, the Zonka bars, I mean, guys, the, the, the OG Zonka bar, I mean, that was you years ago and it's back and, you know, we've all followed and heard and know the stories behind it we're all like oh is that is that is that really the legendary is that legend true you know what i mean <laughs> um like i said i think you know in the last few years with with media the way it is i mean obviously it's opened the doors for a lot of people to get you know their convictions you know changed to get um you know released from prison um to to and then have prosecutors i mean we're starting to see da's and prosecutors all across the country they're, they're not even looking at these cases no more you know what i mean uh which is something that we really need to have because i mean like you said just the, that one just that one start whether it's an eighth a joint something small and stupid the next one is where they're kicking the balls right and then as we talk about a lot on the show once you have a firearm or these other incidences that you may have you're in the business like you said you're, you're kind of targeted for a while you know what i mean and then when you get into that gang stigma it's just like the campus stigma you can't beat it how do you get out of it you know what i mean and and even with all the things that you're doing writing the books doing the shows like you said it was like you am i putting more of a target on my back especially then because you're calling out the system right <laughs> in multiple different levels uh you're a product of the system really let's talk about that because i mean it's just it's a perpetual system it's built for people like us right just to, to chew us up and keep us in there and to keep those funds coming in 
which is sad. Luckily, nowadays, people are realizing the war on drugs really is, right? They're realizing it was a government kind of mandated thing. They realized that it, it was politics. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with this, this, this flower, this plant, like you said, right? We've been utilizing it for years, right? Sherry is medicine. Um, so this is where it gets crazy for me. But talk about medicine. And you had made a point earlier that I want to touch base on before we go to our, our next segment here with the green nurse. Um Crohn's, man. Um, th that's where I'll start for you, really. I mean, th these are the other things that we love to talk about on this show, because not only did you go through a hell of an issue with just the legality of, of, of consuming and, and being a part of the cannabis industry, now you have uh, the medical issues, right? I mean, these are also a huge other crazy heartwarming stories is, is the Crohn's, right? So wh when did you realize it worked for you for that? Well, I mean, I always smoked and it made me feel great. So I was like, yeah, that's working. But I didn't know what my stomach problems were. As a kid growing up in foster homes and group homes, you don't have the best medical care. And whenever you have a tummy ache, it's always an ulcer and they treat it as such. So you take Zantac for 12 years until you realize now you got Crohn's or cancer or some other problems from this medicine they made you take as a kid. Um, in 2007, I was finally diagnosed with Crohn's just after miserable, miserable illnesses and sicknesses and but then they wanted the surgery. They wanted to cut on me. And I, I'm just not totally sold on that being the best option. Everyone I know that has had Crohn's near me, as soon as they had surgery, it got worse. It spread. And I just was not sold on that being the only option. I even opted to listen to the doctors and go with the Balasalis side or the Humera, or the Remicades. And, and I got sick and I got, I, I, my organs exploded, I almost lost my gallbladder. Um, my livers were enzymes were down like I was dying I was getting very very sick so as I started to research alternatives cannabis was always the one that came up and since I knew a lot about growing and, and possessing I just needed to learn the alternatives I needed to learn the other processes and that's what mm. I read and, I, and once I read and I realized and I tried it holy moly life-changing uh, eight years no other drugs I won't even take an ibuprofen um, now all I do is try to teach people about it, you know, and just try to show them. Um, I've, I haven't, I have flare ups, you know, when I screw up and want a beer or <laughs> act like a kid and have a steak or something, you know, it's my fault, but that, that's completely my fault. So, um, but now that I've learned how to kind of control this, now it's all about teaching everyone else and showing them, like, look, you do not have to jump right up and, and take the first opinion. There, 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 there are some other options that could definitely help. Yeah, no, and that's a great, that's, that's great information because I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think a lot of people when they hear these big, you know, Crohn's, Lyme's, all these said diseases, right? Um, what was the first thing you thought of, right? It's like, what goes through your mind? It's like you said, that the drugs, the medications, and do, do they make you feel better? Not necessarily. I think a lot of us oh. can relate to that through multiple different things through our lives. Um, and then, you know, utilizing cannabis, you know, is, is something that, again, is that we got to break that stigma for people to try it. Sherry can talk about this here, you know, all, all day long about the, the, uh, the interactions and how it works, right? Um, because it does work. It really, it really does work, especially get you off those opioids that the doctors will put you on for, for these issues, right? Whether it's Crohn's or, or whatever you may have. Um, when, when you find that out, though, you, like you said, you said it was this was quite a few years ago now, right? Were your doctors at all open to medicinal cannabis use? Oh, no. Oh, no. They, they, especially here, we didn't go medically legal until 2010. So right. there were three years of just, at first, the first two years is just really trying to figure out what the treatments are going to be. Because to me, Crohn's is like, I don't know, the there's so many diseases that have the same symptoms. It's almost like they just pick one until they realize like, Oh no, that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> like it's IBS. No, nope, that's not it. It's ulcerative colitis. Nope. That's not it. Oh, maybe it's growth. And then literally that I was tested as such, you know, four colonoscopies later, 12 endoscopies later. Like it's, I, I got to the point where like, does it really matter at this point? What you tell me is wrong with me. I'm just going to go home and eat a bunch of weed anyhow. So <laughs> I, I felt like it. I, I just, I knew that the medicine wasn't working. I knew that the medicine wasn't doing what I was told the, it should be doing. And you, you just have to listen to your body. I mean, I think your body will tell you a lot if you're willing to hear it. I, I just knew that what I was doing was, wasn't going to end well if I kept on that path. Plus going to prison, you know, you walk off tightrope because 
here I am trying to fight on a medical defense on why a mandatory minimum sentence is ridiculous, especially with a guy with an illness like I have, yet mm -hmm. I don't want to take their medicine. So I don't want to take any of this stuff, but if I don't, I can't walk into court and say, hey, look, I'm following the rules, but I need to be out to take my medicine. You right. know, even though they'll give me a card for cannabis, they're not going to do that in prison. You're not going to be able to have your can. So it's such a conundrum, mixed up situation. And, and everyone knows the DOC doesn't offer health care. I mean, they right. know you're not going to go in with Crohn's and come out healed. Uh, it's, it's usually mm -hmm. the opposite. You know, I, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I had a blood pressure problem one day. I was sitting at my bunk. My feet and ankles got really, really big. And I think it was because of the diet. My body's just not used to pink slime and, you know, sodium filled top ramen. I just, I, I don't eat that stuff. And then when I had to, I had no other choice but to try. Uh, my body responded. I was rushed to medical. Um, they told me I was in congestive heart failure, but wouldn't even give me a water pill. Like, a, so why do you even tell me there's something wrong when you're not going to do anything about it? Yet I still didn't get any Crohn's medicine. The only thing they gave me was uh, a supplemental experimental drug. It was nine pills a day, which I never took. They gave it to me and I hid it. <laughs> I'm not nine pills a day. No, I don't want to grow anything out of my forehead. Like I'm, I'm cool. I, I will deal with Crohn's and top ramen. <laughs> By myself, <laughs> right out of a uh, you know, I, I, it's just I, nobody should ever have to go through this, Chris. I, I, it's just it's my no. A real it's criminal, not like, it's not like a movie through this, from... much less somebody who's done nothing wrong. I, I'm just so sorry, man. Well, right, yeah, like a movie from the 1800s, the... right? It's just What's silly about the whole thing. Just, just so you guys know, is um, today is the five year anniversary of my father passing, so. My first December in jail was 2015. I was sentenced in August of 15 and was in the hole for eight weeks. So I didn't even see the sunlight until they transported me to a medium security yard down on the border of Mexico in Yuma. So when I hit the yard, I finally get sunlight. I finally get to walk outside, kind of getting your bearing about and a couple of weeks on the yard, you're kind of familiar with what's going on. Well, then comes December 23rd. I get a phone call or actually not even a phone call. It's a, a, a speaker call, you know, and you're out on the yard and they yell your name over the intercom and they say, Martin, go to the whip office, which the whip office is the, uh, the employment office. That's where you go and they assign you work or classes or whatever it is you have to do for your program. So I'm, I'm actually excited. I'm like, yes, no more reading Dean Koontz books. I can mop floors or cook food in the kitchen. I'll figure something out. I get a job. And when I walked in, there were three guys standing there all with their hands on their tasers. And I'm kind of like, hey, nice to meet you too. And the one gentleman says, do you know, uh, he says, someone in your family passed away. We can't let you know who it is until we verify the death certificate. So stay right there. And they're, they're like ready to draw down on me. And I'm standing there like, well, that's a really shitty way to tell somebody any bad news whatsoever. It could probably prompt a really bad response if I were someone else. And uh, I kind of sat back against the wall because I'm, I'm a father of five. And I have a wife of 20 years. And that's my first response is like, oh, shit, what just happened? Lady walks in about 15 minutes later. I'm still being held at Tay taser point or whatever it's called and the lady walks in and says does garrett martin ring a bell and i go yeah it's my dad and he goes he had a heart attack this morning sorry for your loss and she walked off and i just stood there like man you guys gotta get really better at your delivery system around here with how you bring this to people i i can definitely understand why there's tensions and why there's you know the certain situations that happen because if it were handled in a little bit more humanity way or just compassionate way as a human being I think you'd get so much more result and respect out of those people in there you know I'm not an animal or a monster and I wanted to turn into one because mm -hmm. of my surrounding because of the way I was treated and obviously I just lost my dad so mm -hmm. it ain't like you can go cry about it you know you walk around the track and you say your prayer and they did let me call my wife which I think that was the hardest part because she couldn't do anything. She's the one who had to tell the prison. She's the one that had to 
to, to, to kind of break the news and then answer the phone. So, and to not be together through it all, it was just like, wow, man, talk about down when you're down. And I, all I could really think about it was, what if I had been here 30 years or looking at life and, and not going home? Would I have responded the same way to these guys? And why should that matter? Why does it matter how much time I have or don't have? Why can't I get treated like a human being regardless? I didn't right. do anything to not be treated like a human being. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that it's oh man, it's the system system, right? It's the way we design our system, the way we run our shows, and the way we hold our power. And as, as you know, and when it's in prison, you know, we 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 watch and we, we see these documentaries. The, the the cops are just as crooked as the people they're protecting, if if not worse, right? Um, <laughs> so it creates a big problem when you're in prison now. You know, we're, we're going to switch gears here to our to our Green Nurse segment here where we're talking about some uh, some fun stuff with the holiday season coming up and, and eating because we're talking about food and, and cookbooks and, and, and prison and stuff like that, guys. Uh, the holidays yeah. are coming. So we have to be cautious of what we intake and why and how and, and the reasons for it. So uh, we have Nurse Sherry and Nurse Mark today who did their AFA day this morning. So we re-edited their video. We're going to replay it now. Uh, sure. You want to talk, uh, any, any quick intros, any quick stuff? Sure. For anybody who's gonna sure. Tune into the video? So was it this morning, it was this morning's video, right? Yep. So what we talked about was diet and nutrition. And oftentimes too, when we use cannabis, people get the munchies. <laughs> so, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's basically the THC is, um, is stimulating the garrelin hormone. That's going to increase our appetite. A lot of, you know, I'm not going to lie. I wish I got the munchies. I don't usually get the munchies. I kind of wish I would. <laughs> I get excited <laughs> when I get the munchies. So anyways, so for the most part, when people get the munchies and they have food cravings, usually what happens is that is signifying a nutrient depletion. So if you're craving specific foods or craving specific things, it's an opportunity for you to look at what nutritional deficiencies might be existing in your body and some of the other choices that you may make that are gonna upregulate and nourish your endocannabinoid system. So this not only happens with people that get the munchies, but also people that have food cravings in general. So we're gonna talk, so that's what we talk about in this clip. So enjoy. All yeah, <laughs> right, well, here it is. Can I talk with the green nurse, guys? Hey folks, welcome to the nurse market, the green nurse daily dose of AFA where we bring you hope and inspiration for growth and healing so you can start your day off the AF way. <laughs> the AFA way. Whatever way you want to start it off, but AFA is pretty good. <laughs> Sometimes if you consume too much THC, people get the munchies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were talking about that. And why do we get the munchies, right? So here it is. So THC interacts with receptors in our brain that regulate emotions, pain, our sense of smell and taste. It mm -hmm. also promotes the release of a hormone called ghrelin, which stimulates our hunger. So the interesting thing when we get the munchies, one of the things I always like people to consider, because this can happen when you don't get the munchies, food cravings. So if you're craving specific foods, it may indicate a nutritional deficiency. And so when we talk about the endocannabinoid system, we talk about nutrition as being a vital part of how our endocannabinoid system gets nourished. Of course. Your body's right? intuitive, right? Exactly. It knows, it knows what it needs at different and times. And here it is. It's constantly communicating to us and giving us signals. So if right. you are getting the munchies, and these, do you have the little list in front of you too, Mark? I do. Okay, good. So if you are getting the munchies and you're craving something specific, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about your craving, what you need, and what you can eat instead. Yeah. So go ahead, Mark. I'll let you start with the favorite one of most people, mine. <laughs> what? What is it? Sweets? Chocolate. Oh! Just that dark chocolate. Mm. Right? Oh, I love that. Too. And so what do you need when you need, when you're craving chocolate, Sherry, which, you know, I've found that there are a lot of people who do crave chocolate. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So what are, what are you magnesium, right? Yeah. So magnesium, and you can find it in cacao as well. 
you sure. know, but it's in nuts, seeds, veggies, fruits, right? Mm-hmm. So you look for magnesium. A lot of times we are magnesium deficient, you know, sure. by the nature of the beast that a lot of, we are a country that is overfed and undernourished because we're not getting the micronutrients that we need. Right. That's the bottom line. So what about your craving for sugary food? There is a list of things. Oh man. Chromium, carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, tryptophan. Right. Yeah, all of those. That may be some of the things, those may be some of the things that you need. So what do you eat instead of those? Well, chromium, broccoli, which isn't my favorite. (laughs) Broccoli. Love broccoli. Grapes, cheese, Mm -hmm. and chicken. So chromium can be found in there. Yeah. Carbon Mm -hmm. and fresh fruits. Mm Mm-hmm. Phosphorus, chicken, beef, fatty fish, eggs, dairy, nuts, veggies, and grains. Mm. Sugary foods also stimulate our need for sulfur type food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cranberries, horseradish, cabbage, and cauliflower. God, I'm getting hungry, Sherry. This I, is I know. Delicious stuff. I know. And then tryptophan. Mm-hmm. Those are interesting things for tryptophan. What to eat instead? Cheese, raisins, sweet potatoes, and spinach. Yeah. Kind of cool. So what if you're craving bread and pasta and other carbs? What might you need? You might need nitrogen. Your body may be calling for nitrogen. And what are some of the other things that you can eat instead? High-protein foods, meat, fatty fish again, nuts, beans, chia seeds. Yeah. Yep. Oily food. What about oily, yep. greasy foods? If you're if you're just- Oh, big pizza. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So another big one, calcium. So we yeah. might need some calcium. We might have some calcium deficiencies. So organic milk, cheeses, green leafy vegetables. Green right. leafy vegetables have so much calcium in it. Kale. I mean, we know that calcium is just vital to, to proper cellular respiration and just cell function, right? Cell calcium function, cardiac. Huge. Yes, yes. If your calcium levels are up, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Okay, salty. Okay, interesting thing about salty foods. Salt mm-hmm. is pretty much sodium chloride. Real pink Himalayan sea salt has all of the minerals. We're talking a ton of minerals. And so that white table salt mm-hmm. that you get is stripped of all the other minerals. So if you right. are craving salty foods, you may need chloride mm-hmm. and silicon, right? Yeah. So there's certain other things that you can get it from. Fatty mm-hmm. fish. Goat yep. milk, cashews, nuts, seeds. Mm. The other thing that I have found that I have replaced that has really helped me a lot, and people see, you know, yep. that salt sodium restricted diet is using that real salt. I actually have gotten some of the big giant Himalayan sea salt and mm-hmm. I use blender to crush it up. So it's just getting those other minerals in your body that are sometimes hard to absorb. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. You know, we got to be gentle with ourselves. You were just talking about it. You know, we set up these patterns of action based on stress reaction. We eat, it soothes us. We get that dopamine response. Guess what? Be gentle on yourself. Yeah. It's just how it goes. You can recognize it for what it is and relax into it. It's going to be okay. Absolutely going to be okay. And remember, Sherry. You're absolutely fucking amazing, exactly as you are. If you happen to have some foods that you don't feel particularly good about after you eat, recognize it for what it is. Yes. Over time, over time, you'll begin to recognize that you might not want to partake in those foods. It's it's really over time. Be gentle. Be gentle, and just and and it's just from a and I'm I'm speaking out of love, not out of shame yeah. the reason why is because my autoimmune condition it gets mm-hmm. triggered mm-hmm. when i don't eat right granted i cheat all the time mm-hmm. but i definitely pay for it so yeah you know, the bottom line is that, that inflammation the inflammatory response that gets triggered mm-hmm. and cortisol and then you know these chronic pain syndromes can yeah manifest. yeah so truly so that's why we do what we do is we love to teach health and wellness we want to nourish our endocannabinoid system cannabinoids are one piece of the pie one piece great tool to nourish our endocannabinoid system and pairs really well with the other pie pieces that's why we talk about 
The umbrella. The umbrella. So, the umbrella. So if you or someone you love is suffering from chronic pain, chronic illness, or if you know of someone or you are interested in incorporating cannabis into your routine for health and wellness, or if you're new to adult use cannabis and you want to try it, figure out how to have an experience that's fun and safe for you. Contact us, the Green Nurse, www.thegreennurse.com. And while supplies last, I know it's going fast, Mark, but for every appointment that's booked, there will be a nurse, a bottle of Nurse Mark CBD given as a gift, but only while supplies last. They've been, they've been flying off the shelf. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the end of the year baby coming in 2021 (laughs) absolutely and listen if you're in the healthcare space if you're helping people be more healthy come join us we'd love to have you check us out at thegreennurse.com we're on a journey and we want you to join us we want you to be a part of that journey too All right. <laughs> Another great segment there. Talking about food, everybody's favorite thing. Uh, we have Chris on with us today. You can probably relate to a lot of that. And man, you pointed out a couple of things of, of chosen diets, right? I think that's, just, we all talk about the stoner image with cannabis, right? We talk about, you know, the, the couch, fat, lazy kind of stigma that we get, right? But, but, but people forget, like, some of our greatest athletes are stoners. You know what I mean? Some of the healthiest people on our planet are stoners, right? right. Um I appreciate all ways of using cannabis. You know, when I educate on cannabinoid therapeutics, therapeutics, I teach there's three ways to use it, medically, recreationally, and irresponsibly. And you don't need us to teach you how to do it irresponsibly, right? We want to teach people how to have a safe experience. Cannabis is here. It's not going away. As health professionals, we have a moral, legal, ethical obligation to teach on the most misunderstood plant in the world. We all have an endocannabinoid system that is affected by everything that we're doing or not doing in our lives. And oftentimes cannabinoids are the key that unlocks the door to what is missing in so many patients' lives, including my own and all the patients that I've worked with. So as you know, I'm very passionate about this plant Um, and I like to have fun with it too. So that's the part too, is that, you know, when you've looked at death in the eye as many times as I had, you know, suffering with these chronic debilitating illnesses, it kind of changes your perspective. You want to teach from a point that is going to make people comfortable, right? And sometimes humor comes in. And so I like to bring a little bit of humor into my education, you know? And the other thing that I always like to talk about as well is how the community has helped me. Before I stepped into the medical space as a clinician, I learned from the adult use community. It's a big part of my story. So I you know, truly feel that this plant is the most misunderstood plant in the world. And as the green, as nurses, as green nurses in the cannabis industry, we're here to truly educate and empower patients to use this for whatever way they want to use it to live their best life. I keep saying that over and over. That's what it's about. <laughs> no, we love it. We love it. Uh, no, it's another great segment. It brings up another host of things that people need to understand like we can cook with cannabis there's other there's other endocannabinoids out there that are not just in cannabis we find them in multiple foods right um and 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 things everywhere so it's about utilizing them thinking healthily right you know we don't need to have ramen like chris was saying you know we don't have to have ramen we you know we have uh his cookbook now we can all look at and, and, and learn how to cook it, right? Uh, <laughs> no, but no, it's it, it's great, especially with the holidays coming up. Everybody, like you said, we're all going to cheat. I can't wait to cheat. I'm actually really excited to do a lot of cheating this year, more than I probably have in, in most years. Uh, now that we've been locked down for almost a whole year, we're going into 2021. Hopefully, I'll turn around. Um, but now we're going to talk to Tim a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about news, uh, some of the light recent stuff that I've seen, crazy shit going on in the world. Uh, this past week, Timothy Fair, Vermont Campus Solutions. Tim, welcome Good back. I uh, <laughs> love having you on. Um, so reading the news, uh, very interesting. We always talk about California, how much of a big fuck show California is on, on cannabis, right? Uh, and it's, it's usually they take one step forward and about eight steps backwards in everything they do, especially of late. But it looks like this is another fun one that can can you clarify this for us? Um, 
Reading articles, I say nearly 60 Los Angeles cannabis businesses are poised to lose their licenses on New Year's Day. Um, and it seems like they're not going to be able to renew these. What's going on in uh, California with this, Tim, especially in L.A.? <laughs> so, I mean, we've talked a lot about California and kind of the uniqueness uh, of what makes California as the place it is. And the fact is they've had a de facto cannabis system for 20 years, over 20 years, you know, since really uh, the night, late 1990s when they legalized medical. Um, there was basically for 20 years a laissez-faire attitude taken towards it. Um, there wasn't a lot of regulation. There wasn't a lot of problems. The state kind of with, with nudge nudge, it developed, there were supply chains, and it developed a working cannabis industry. Um, and then, you know, it got big, and then regulation needed to come. And in 2018, when they passed <laughs> legalized adult use, what they really did was impose a incredibly rigid, incredibly difficult to comply with regulatory structure on both growers, especially on growers. Growers got hit the worst on it. Uh, but, you know, retail as well. Um, but there were thousands of retail shops that weren't in compliance. So you, the only people who could be in compliance wasn't the ones who wanted to be, it was the ones who could afford to be, because it was incredibly expensive to come into compliance. And there were people, two generations in some cases, who'd had their business, had these supply chains, had these like, you know, and, and so you had now all of the people who built this, built this industry, built the largest industry in the world. You know, California is enormous. California is the seventh largest economy on the planet. They built a success and they had it all taken away from them and they had to the people who could afford to be going to compliance. Um, that, that created a, a very, very, very difficult dynamic within the state. You did not have these smaller operators wanting us success. You did not, you know, and you had these major players who had millions of dollars, who put millions of dollars in it, now dropping dimes and knocking out the small guys because, well, I pay my money. So, you know, that type of mentality, it, it's just disgusting. Now, on top of that, you overlay the regulatory structure of California. You know, we're in Vermont. We're blessed in Vermont. We don't realize how lucky we are. We don't have county government. Local government's minimal. We got state government. State says something, we follow, we see the rule, we follow the rule, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of states that would really, really like to be that. Um, and California is one of those because you have local ordinances. Then you have county ordinances where county government has an incredibly amount, large amount of power in California. Then you had state ordinances. You got three levels of regulations, sometimes more. They don't always work together. Sometimes they're in direct opposition to each other. Um, so you have, I, I mean, when I say it's just to show out there, this is why it's the people are wonderful. Some of my closest colleagues, um, you know, are California cannabis law attorneys. Because <laughs> you really, really need one out there uh, just to navigate. I mean, you've got towns that are split by county where delivery is legal in one part, but it's not legal in the other part. <laughs> you know, trying to figure this out. And, you know, and with, uh, you know, the cannabis businesses in Los Angeles right now, you're seeing city authorities, you know, you're seeing the city, you know, step in. Um, but you also have to realize in LA, there are hundreds of dispensaries, most of them not regulated, you know? So it's kind of like, it remains, even in the most mature cannabis market in the United States, uh, still remains the wild west. So, uh, you know, now this particular one is just another example of what I would claim to be over-regulation. Um, you know, this is bu bureaucratic BS, uh, annual license renewal applications. Um, you know, did to get your license application in on the right day? Was it stamped? Was it mailed? You know, in the time of COVID, there, where there's this understanding amongst most bureaucracies that, you know what, paperwork's going to take some time. Our court cases, even here in Vermont, a relatively small case, extended out. They're granting exceptions. They're granting, you know, I, I, everyone is so understanding of the difficulties posed by this pandemic. Except apparently the Los Angeles Cannabis Control Commission because, sorry, if it wasn't postmarked and dated on the exact same date and it wasn't on an eight by four and a half inch card written in blue ink, half of it black ink on the second half and submitted in triplicate, we're going to yank your license. We're going to take your livelihood away. And that's basically what we're hearing here, you know, and it's... It goes back and forth because depending on who's in control, depending on who happens to be appointed the chair of any particular county board or, you know, county commission, you know, one day everything's okay, the next day it's not. One day you're good to go, the next day they're coming after you. How do you operate in that? You know, mm -hmm. and I think this is just yet another example of how difficult it is um, to try to make a living in the cannabis industry in California right now. Well, just to pile on top of that, the states are just following domino effect down the line. Arizona, 
we repeat everything you guys do 12 years later. So I, I don't know why, <laughs> like I, I was this huge proponent of 207, our, our rec that just passed here because it's corporatizing. It, it was wrote by the three largest dispensary groups in our state. They've allowed for each municipality to vote separately. I mean, it's, it's we're watching it just repeat itself, history repeating itself all over again. And we scream from the top of the mountaintops and no one's listening. And it just kind of travels across the country doing the same thing. Yep. No, really, it does, um, which is sad. It, it's really, really, really sad. Um, there's a lot of news that's come out today, guys. It's going to be recent recent news. I'm going to smack uh, Tim with really quickly. Um, <laughs> one of the things um, I really want to talk to Tim about was, you know, obviously we just had – uh, a COVID bill passed, right? And within this COVID bill, we're looking for hopefully some some protection for our cannabis industry. Did we get it? Did we get anything? Uh, what are we looking at here? <laughs> no, our good, our good buddy Mitch McConnell went out of his way to uh, cheer the fact that, uh, you know, none of those Democratic marijuana provisions got into this bill. Just our, you know, corporate handouts to the billionaires. Um, plenty of those in there, believe me. Um, but no, unfortunately, not yet. Um, you know, that was something that would have been a absolute uh, showstopper in terms of getting this thing through. And, you know, the power the Democrats realized that this is not the time. It wasn't the time to make this stand. This is a bill that needs to be passed because people are running out of food. They can't eat. They're being evicted. This is, you know, uh, th this needs to happen. And the fact that it took this long and the fact that it was as watered down as it was is disgusting enough. But to use this particular bill to, you know, make a stand over cannabis regulation, nobody thought that was a good idea. The most hardcore proponents agreed. This is not the time. Um, you know, the time is going to be after we see what happens in the Georgia runoff election. You know, we've had this talk a lot, Joe. And that is, I don't think people who really understand how important to the next two years those two elections are. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, night and day, literally. Senate. The Senate yep. control um, that, uh, the, you know, having your, the majority leader be Mitch McConnell versus having the majority leader be Chuck Schumer, you could not get two more different legislative bodies. I mean, so, you know, th this is incredibly important. And as mm -hmm. far as cannabis reform goes and a wealth of issues, it's going to depend if if they win, if the Republicans hold the Senate, we will not see much in the way of federal cannabis reform. Maybe the Safe Banking Act, maybe, um, but that would even be a long shot. Anything else, we're, now we're on hold two years at the federal level. Um, mm. If Democrats take it, that's not to say the next day we're all going to be, you know, legalized, <laughs> but, but at least there's a much stronger likelihood that we're going to see something like the Moore Act be adopted. Um, yeah. uh, you know, the Safe Banking Act will almost certainly move forward with a different chair of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, you know, I, I'm telling you, Canada is just one tiny little thing. When you look at all of what could possibly be affected, uh, depending on a Democratic or a Republican-controlled Senate, this, these two races are probably the most important we're going to see in, since, you know, 2016. Right. I don't think people really realize that because the, uh, the effect of, uh, you know, we, we, we see McConnell going, hey, you know, we, we love what's going on. Um, oh, what's going on here? Uh, hey, excuse me, doing the show. Uh, hold on, guys. Sorry, uh, I'm trying to do this now. Um, so <laughs> I get people calling me up now in the middle of the show. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so being that said, sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. Um, one thing I want to talk about today, and uh, I'm sure Chris will appreciate this, and Tim and everybody else. Um, can you? Thank you. Um, is the governor of Michigan? The governor of Michigan is uh, granted clemency to four currently incarcerated people who are serving time for nonviolent drug offenses. Right? I don't know if you guys have saw this. This was within the last day or so. Um, hopefully, you know this is huge because one of these guys uh, was Michael Thompson. Uh, who is facing a 42 to 60 year sentence for selling three pounds of weed. Uh, this is something we were talking about before with um, the... Uh... It, it's insane. It, it's absolutely, you know, this is, and, and Chris, I, again, I, I just said that as a criminal defense attorney, as someone who's, you know, representing defending clients, uh, this is why I became a lawyer. You know, I, I don't drive a Lexus. I don't, 
in my house. I live in an apartment and I got an old Subaru. Um, you know, I don't do it for the money. I do it because of exactly this, because people like, you know, and I'm just so happy thrilled you found an investigator who you know uh, had enough pull to actually get things moved forward i was going to ask if you had you know a lawyer that actually cared um and since so many of these cases you know these public defenders and i, I was a public defender right out of law school i don't want to knock the public defender system there's a lot of really talented really caring attorneys who are incredibly overworked incredibly underpaid and just you know the system is broken you know, we are lucky, again, I talk a lot about how lucky we are in Vermont. I would say, Chris, I mean, this doesn't do you any good, but here that would never have happened. You know, yeah. this is so regional and so, but nobody, and I say this all the time, should have ever spent a day in prison for pot. It, I, it, had a, yeah. I had a public defender when we started and he told me you will get no less than 11 years. And I fired him. I told him to go, I'll represent myself. You're and right. I knew I represent myself but I knew he wasn't going to represent me so there was a gentleman by the name of Alan Bickert he used to be a former public defender but went on to private practice barred in four different states he was 86 years old when he took on my case um and he was the real he was Columbo he was the guy that pissed the whole courtroom off he would he would he would address the detective by detective and not special agent like he asked and I mean he was just that guy you know um, so when the when the state actually offered me the plea bargain and I balled it up and I threw it back at the state physically like literally I laughed I said no I'm not admitting guilt on anything he's the guy that looked at the lawyer and said time or looked at the judge and said time out we need a break can can I take my client in the hallway now mind you this guy's like four foot eight and 86 years old and I'm 6'1", 250 covered in tattoos from my neck down. We get out in the hallway, he pins me against the door, slam. I'm like, <laughs> this guy goes, do you understand what conceding means? And I'm like, yeah, you're asking me to do it. He said, no, the state did. The state conceded. When they offered you a two year plea bargain instead of taking you to trial for a hundred years, that's them giving up. That's them saying that they do not want to fight you. They don't want to go to trial with you. And yeah, you sure can. You want to go to trial? He said, I'll walk right back in there and I'll defend you till the wheels fall off. But when they give you 10 to 15, don't call my office every Christmas missing your wife and kids when I remind you of the chance that you could have took you two years and went home. So that was literally, I mean, I, I felt as if I had no choice. If, if I went to trial, I was going to lose even if I was going to win. So uh, that's as, what most people are faced with. And I ran out of money. And the only reason Alan was even on my case was because out of the goodness of his heart. He, he didn't, he only took the special cases, the big complex cases. And he said it, he goes, I chose you. I read your case and I wanted it. He goes, honestly, I feel like the two years is a win. Uh, arrest his soul. He passed away a year after uh, I was sentenced. But uh, I, I feel like he, he probably did better for me than, than a lot of attorneys might have done just because it was Yavapai. And nobody wants to fight Yavapai. Uh, you walk in there and I'm telling you, it's the most kangaroo court I've ever seen. When, when we have a motion to suppress on, on, the, on the table and my, my lawyer's got the, the officer who is in question on the Brady list on the stand. And that dude blurts out some noise that has nothing to do with our case. And the judge allows it. There's a problem. Someone needs to watch. Someone needs to come down here and see this. So we had a situation where the, the lead detective was a piece of shit. He, he, he had done it not only to me, but to several other people, especially as easy targets with prior convictions. But he had lied to the jury. He had planted evidence. And it was all coming out in this motion to suppress. And all of a sudden, he blurts out, well, I watched the defendant commit an armed robbery. And we're all looking around going, uh, I don't have armed robbery on my charges. And that was allowed to come in as testimony? He blurted it out in the middle of the courtroom where my lawyer's losing his mind. My <laughs> yeah, I would be too. The judge tells my lawyer that there's no reason to go on with the motion to suppress because the the officer has no reason to lie. So at that moment, we lost the motion to suppress, and I had to, I was faced with trial at that moment. And the, the, there was no armed robbery. He was talking about some situation where my club was at a bar, 
and one of my ex-members showed up and there was a political problem where he had left my club not on good terms and started a new club without following the rules. So the people who really run the state and say how the rules go said he couldn't do that. So I had the option of handling it. And all I did was talk to him and say, hey man, you should probably take your colors off. And as soon as he took them off, he handed them to my sergeant at arms and they left. So I guess that was filmed by this detective and they said it was an armed robbery, but I didn't have any arms. I didn't even touch the cut. Um, all we did was tell the guy, look, if you're not going to show up to meetings and pay your dues, you can't run around and act like a motorcycle club. There's rules here. There's, there's things we do as clubs that help us succeed and you're not doing it. The cop mm. filmed it and wanted to blurt it out in my motion to suppress on my cannabis hearing. Um, it had nothing to do with nothing. Nobody even charged me with that. I can't believe a judge left that in. I, I mean, that's... Oh, he threw my motion to suppress out because of it. <laughs> you know, I, this is it's disgusting. And, and you know, and no matter what, been, you say, it wouldn't have mattered. Get that we shouldn't even have gone to trial or had a plea bargain. It should, we should have won right there. We should have been able to walk out of the courtroom right there. First place. Well, and it's again, it's it's part of that uh, that perpetual you know police issue that we have. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's well, they wanted to... their they wanted their two million dollars back from the raid that they just spent. Like, well, you know, they've been watching me for years and building this case. They said it was a two million dollar raid. And my little <laughs> half a million dollar asset forfeiture isn't going to cover that. No. <laughs> no. Nope. $600 make a week. Good luck for the rest of the pandemic. Uh, all right. We are just our priorities in this country. We, lost our, we no. lost our asset forfeiture before I was even convicted. The asset forfeiture was gone the first year of court. What? I lost gone. I didn't even. So what happens if I win my case? Like, you just going to give me my stuff back? Like, I mean, literally, they took everything and it was gone. They told I lost the asset forfeiture before two and a half years before I was sentenced. We saw that happen in, in Arizona with Subcool. When Subcool got raided um, a couple of years ago, they literally took his fucking trophies, his awards, everything. Yep. Trucks, yep. cars, oh, they, house. They had my wedding ring. They took my yeah. rosary out of my car. I mean, that you you name it, they took it. If it wasn't nailed down, it was there. I have video of the cops riding my Harley out of my clubhouse wearing one of my soft cuts out of my clubhouse. So there's video of this cop wearing all my garb out of my club and riding my bike. I mean, literally, you're supposed to secure my property on the back of a truck and haul it away, not go parading around town on my motorcycle like it was a badge of honor for them that they, they got the big guy really i have videos still in my youtube channel showing it like we try to blast them out any chance we get because it was illegal how come the cop, cops can wear cuts the cops can be in a club if you honestly if you the only thing that really helped us out on this whole thing with the cops and the club and the was the fact that six months to the day after my raid there was an incident in prescott where this whole story took place. So mm -hmm. all the cops that rode in the motorcycle club called the Iron Brotherhood decided that they were gonna throw a Christmas party on Whiskey Row. Everyone who's from Yavapai or in Prescott that knows Whiskey Row knows there's an ordinance that you don't wear gang colors down there. You're not allowed mm -hmm. to wear your cut. You're not allowed, I don't care if you're a Boy Scout, you can't wear your little handkerchief in there. It, the Crips and Bloods don't party there and neither do motorcycle clubs. Well, the cops, because of their positions, had rented out a bar and down on Whiskey Row and they wore their colors with their badges underneath and their guns and all this crazy stuff, which I was getting phone calls left and right. Like, dude, these guys are down here totally in our bar doing what you guys are never allowed to do. So after the, they got drunk and, and things got a little rowdy that night, they were asked to leave their, the bar that they were having the party hosted at. So they just went down Whiskey Row, bar after bar, trying to get into a bar. Well, where they made the mistake was they went into Moctezuma's, which is owned by a very dear friend of mine that I went to college with. And uh, I've known the head of security there since we played baseball together at Yavapai. So like they're in my backyard on film acting like jerks. So mm. it, so happened that one of my hangarounds was in the bar. One of my guys who's riding with the club that wants to get into the club is at the bar. 
with my club, I don't make you wear your colors when you're out with your family. Like we're not militant. We're, we're just guys that ride bikes. So he's sitting there with his family partying and he sees all these drunk cops walking in, but they're wearing colors. And he's like, wait a minute, what is this sons of anarchy? Like we, we can't do this. This is not right. So my guy wants to earn his pats by confronting him. He walks right up to the chief of one of the the police departments and says you do you realize you can't serve two masters and pokes him in the chest the cops jumped him they broke his jaw they broke his nose they drug him out of the bar um, it's all on video and if you go to the daily courier our newspaper up there it was the top story in 2013 um, in arizona so it talks about him with a crime too oh it, what's crazy is when the police were called because of this huge fight with these gang members the police the street police that showed up were told to go away because the gang cops already had it under control and they were trying to sweep it under the rug so when my guy who owns the bar calls me up and goes chris aren't you fighting this huge case with the state that's trying to bury you and call you a gang member i go yeah he goes come watch this and when I watched the video of all the cops that were in the raid, raiding my family, beating up one of my hangarounds, I walked straight across the street to my attorney's office and I handed him the video. Within a matter of weeks, I was handed the two year plea bargain. So, you know, damn well, those dudes don't want to go to trial and have the truth come out, even if it meant me doing 10 years or more. They didn't want the story out there. That's why I wrote the book in DACO. Because if it came out later and I knew all this and my house burnt down, you think anyone's going to give two shits about it? Nobody's going to give two cares why some bearded biker candy maker got ran over by a truck. Nobody's going to care. I put it out there because eyes need to open and be aware of your surrounding and what's going on. Had I not been aware and apparent, I'd be sitting on damn near death row right now. You know, if I didn't spend the money on the, the on the private eye instead of dumping it on a lawyer like we're programmed to do, are we, isn't that how we're taught the system works? Oh, you get a lawyer. They're going to take care of you. No, they're going to funnel you into the biggest deal that they can imagine as a, I mean, I've watched it. I'm watching dudes getting twice the time for the same thing that a guy with money's got, you know, yeah. it's Listen, and, and that's why we came forward was to show exactly. the broken system to yeah. show that yeah. there's yeah. more to this than just a bad law absolutely broken yeah. the status that just just status white black racial status uh money status i mean we've seen we've seen rich white kids rape women and get a couple of months in prison and you're going you know what I mean? Because I, I've of, said it. Of, I, because I, the judge feels bad to ruin his life. I don't think the judge felt bad to ruin your life, did he? Like, and, you know, this is where this is where it gets crazy among the judicial system with consistency. You know what I mean? Um, like you said, if you're just in the wrong town for one thing, and you get your name known, they're just out to get you, right? Uh, yeah, and you luckily, do. I was just a white biker. You know Good. what I mean? All I can say is I'm the lucky guy. If I would have been hmm. another race or another situation, I. <sighs> Been I wouldn't great. be here. I wouldn't be chatting with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I you, you've taken the best out of the worst situations you could probably get yourself into legitimately, and I, I say that with all, uh, you know, with all positives in mind. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you you're really the story. Like, uh, you know, it proves a point that you know shit can happen to people, man shit you know just shit luck shit 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 and it seems like you know the more it happens it's hard to stay positive but i mean you've literally turned this whole story into books documentaries uh you know a pest company you know your 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 chef and then we even talk about hempful farms i mean just the name alone in itself is great but before we get back to that there's two more things i want to get to because i want to get to thomas then we'll all come back we'll wrap it up and tell everybody where they can find us um, but one, the one last thing I want to ask Tim, and this is something that we all should talk about, I believe, because I think this is important from a medical level to a grower's level to, to, to anybody in this industry is canopy growth. I don't know if you guys saw this today, but they uh, say GW Pharma. I can tell Tim's, Tim, Tim can't wait to talk about this. <laughs> on the CBD strategy. <laughs> Alex, right so now so now here comes a really interesting thing tim i don't know what to even call this right now because now we have gw pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals that are producing epidolex right that are selling in many countries 
And now we have canopy growth that says, hey, you just infringed on our product. What does this no, mean? No, no, no. So what canopy growth is claiming that GW Pharma infringed on their extraction technology, uh, patented extraction technology, of which patent was just recently awarded. But uh, the way the US patent works, when you're applying for a patent, as it's pending, you still have those protections. But they, I'm not going to get into the weeds with it. But um, basically, they're making an assertion that GW stole there or copied there or somehow improperly became aware of their extraction technique and then used it for commercial gain. Um, is there any validity or merit behind the case? I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I think discovery would be interesting. Um, I find <laughs> that it's happening now after, you know, uh, Bruce Linton's out and there's a new CEO after Aurora's, mm -hmm. you know, sky and sun, 9 million square foot my are all like decrepit <laughs> housing like cargo now um you know <laughs> at this stage in the ridiculous up and enormous down of the canadian big three afria uh canopy growth aurora you know we're kind of at the end game now and canopy because of uh constellations investment has managed to keep their share price up um is this real i doubt it you know, I, I really do. It doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense why a UK, a British pharmaceutical company that has experience making pharmaceuticals would need to steal a Canadian cultivator's extraction technique. I, you know, it just, it doesn't on the surface seem to make any sense. It seems to me to be a play by the new CEO. Maybe they'll settle. <laughs> maybe we get a little money, maybe we get a little publicity. Uh, we've got, you know, Constellation brand money behind us, which means that we can afford lawyers to just file motion after motion after motion. Um, I mean, we think of pharmaceutical companies as big, but, uh, you know, Constellation brands makes GW Pharma look about that big. Mm. Um, you know, so I'm curious how much, you know, and that had to have been where it came from is the boardroom of Constellation. I don't think a newly appointed CEO would do something like this on their own without, you know, mom and pop's okay. Mm -hmm. um and it'll be interesting to see where it comes out i, I just anything i see with canopy growth or, or after these days i just take with a grain of salt um you know well, could, this, could this have an impact well could this have an impact on the uh the epidolics i mean does this have an impact on that market if if they are found to be or convicted well, this to is just a civil case this isn't like oh my god gw pharma collapses or anything it's just a civil litigation case and what will happen is it'll it'll never go to trial they'll do discovery and they'll find out whether there really is a case, whether there really is anything to move forward on. And if there is, GW will write a check. And if there isn't, GW's lawyers will file for summary judgment, have it uh, dismissed. Um, you know, it'll never come to trial. And it's, again, it's, it's money. It, it just comes down to money. Um, who's going to get money? Can GW Pharma get maybe a couple mil, 50 mil, 60 mil right now? Seriously, I mean, these companies need everything they can get. They overextended themselves when their stock prices were so ridiculously inflated. You're giving a billion, billion dollar valuations to companies that were losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year. You mm. know, I mean, that was just, you know, in 2018, it's like, really? <laughs> All this based on this concept of like future profits. And then what happens when Canada legalized, they realized eh, you're not going to see that amount of profits in an incredibly regulated system where Health Canada basically, you know, owns everything mm. uh, with 34 million people with less people than live in California. Uh, you're, you're not, it's not a huge population. There's not billions and billions and billions of dollars to be made to spread all around in Canada. And there was just, I think this sense of exuberance um, and now it's coming crashing down and whatever's going to work, right? It's a lawsuit. Right. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, that's my feeling. We'll see. You know, over the next, you know, I think with the new year with Discovery, you know, by, you know, midway through next year, we'll know if that case has any merit or if it just kind of goes the way of the dodo bird. I mean, from a from a grower extractor standpoint, like Thomas, right? I mean, how how tricky is it to to have extractions, to process materials, to do these things without stepping on other people's feet? I mean, it seems like most extraction methods are pretty common, aren't they? They are, for the most part. I mean, everybody has their own little uh, processes, their own little uh, pieces that say, "Oh, this is my you know individual processor. This is my proprietary process." Uh, I personally like to go the, the way of uh, Elon Musk and just say, you know, everybody can you use the information. You know, the plant was put here for everybody to use. Uh, you know, the process should be for everyone to use too. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, there's plenty of companies out there that can do one minute thing different than everybody else in their process, whether it's a temperature change or a set amount of time that they keep uh, a product at a certain point in their process. If they can prove that they were the first ones to do that, uh, 
I think Tim would know better than I would, but I think at that point they actually have a, a legitimate case. Mm. In, again, in patent law is so tricky. And what you have here now is an international patent law case. So you've got a British, you know, supposedly a British violation. You know, the question is, was it going to be something that is so, you know, unique, so novel, so have never been done that it would be possible for anybody else to find it? Uh, you know, and, and it just raises a whole lot of questions. It, it's just, and I, you know, I was reading through the complaint, the actual complaint that was filed in the case. They've got it on, I think, marijuana moment. Um, and, and it's just kind of vague, uh, you know, processing relating to uh, hexane and uh, ethanol extraction. You know, uh, what, what we, you know, I, it's just, there's so many different little possibilities. And what they would eventually be looking for is this: okay, you used our technology without our permission. Now we want a percentage of what you're making off of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a money play. It's not, you know, anything other than that. And maybe and they're figuring, you know, what the heck, maybe they can get a little, maybe they can say, yeah, you know, we bring our, you know, room to 72 and a half degrees. And that's our big secret. And they knew it. So, that, you know, God only knows what kind of, you know, take on ethanol extraction is basically yeah. ethanol extraction. You know, this is not, you know, seriously nuclear physics here. Um, right. So, I, you know, again, but maybe there is, maybe there's some pr super duper proprietary method that for some reason canopy growth has not been utilizing to make millions and millions here, um, but GW stole it and, you know, is making millions off of dialects and they want their piece. Yeah. You know, I, mean, that's that's, I mean, that's the, no, that's the long, the very short, short version. I mean, that's why we asked that question to Thomas was, you know, what, how many, how many processes, what's, what's the tricks? What, I mean, are these little trademarks and, and, and patents on, on the littlest temp, like you said, temperatures or differences, like where, where are they, where, where is this becoming important to them? Um, but, but as you said, uh, we're talking about labs, we're talking about all this great gear and all these fun things that need to be clean. We're going to roll right into Thomas's segment this week, which is cleaning your gear, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the maid today. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, last week I had actually stopped by a client's uh, home, and when I went and looked in their tent, uh, I saw a lot of issues. One of the issues being that everything was dirty. Uh, they've been up and running since 2018, and they have not cleaned anything. They, I guess maybe they swept once or twice here or there, uh, but they yeah. haven't cleaned their fans. Uh, they haven't cleaned any of their lights or their hoods, anything along those lines. So uh, that gave me the idea to, uh, to teach beginner growers a quick and easy way to clean off your fans, your hoods, and uh, the solution that I particularly use uh, for cleaning them off. So I actually took his fan home with me to, just so I could clean it for the, uh, the segment and we'll be delivering it back to him tomorrow on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, all right, guys, this is something we talk about a lot, especially when it comes to bugs and molds and things of that other nature. You just got to keep your rooms clean, man. And it's, it's not that hard. It's just like your pieces, your pipes, right down to what you smoke with, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, for your best experience, keep it clean. Here it is. Uh, Thomas Marco, Vermont Grow Coaching with keeping your shit clean. Hey guys, Tom with Vermont Grow Coaching, and welcome to Grower's Guide, your weekly beginner friendly cannabis tips and tricks. This week on Grower's Guide, we're going to take a step back and take a look at your grow setup. We've got this nasty looking fan here that we picked up from a client's location. I took a stop out there the other day and I noticed all this nasty stuff they had going on on the fan. So I said, you know what? I'm going to leave you with a spare and I'm going to borrow your fan for a couple of days. So I'm going to show you how to properly clean one of these fans. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that some people will tell you, go ahead and remove the face of the fan. That's going to keep it clean for you. That is a horrible idea for two reasons. Number one, I like to use metal blade fans, and I tell all of my clients to use metal blade fans. <laughs> if you whack your head against one of these, it's going to freaking hurt. You'll probably bleed, too. It's best to stay away from that. Number two, if you don't have a cage on the front of your fan, you don't know whether or not you have a problem. There's a lot of gunk going on here. There's a couple of leaves. 
There's some, it looks like cat hair, maybe some dog hair. And so it's just some uh, general fuzz uh, going on on the front of this fan. Unfortunately, that means that this grow room has not been properly cleaned. Now, we're not going to get into grow room cleaning today, but I'm going to show you how to clean one of these fans properly without damaging the fan and maintaining a proper air circulation throughout your grow room. All right, so what you'll need, you're going to need some green soap, some clean rags, some warm water, and some tools to open your fan. The dilution rate is simple. Mix one quarter cup of green soap with one quarter gallon or one quart of warm water. All right, so go ahead and rub your hand around the inside and the outside of the cage, as well as the fan blade. This is gonna help get off a fair amount of that gunk before we actually start washing with the rag. You can see here in this video that there is very little left actually on the cage after running my hands over it. However, I still wanna go over it with a final wash afterwards, to help get any sticky residue off. Okay, as you can see, we made these pretty clean even without using any sort of solution. Now go ahead and grab that bowl of solution that I told you how to make just a few minutes ago, and we're going to go ahead and give these components a good wipe down. The best way to do this is going to be to grab your rag, get it nice and moist, and then wring out as much moisture as you possibly can. You don't want to be getting too much moisture on these components. All right, so now you grab a moist paper towel and you go ahead and you wipe off any of the residual soap, any of the residual grime that might be left on there. We get it nice and clean. And from there, we just go ahead and let these parts air dry uh, for about an hour or two until they're nice and dry before we go ahead and put them back together. All right, so that's it. Super easy, super simple, get your gear clean. Now, in the event that you don't have the soap we use in this video, you can use one tablespoon of 70% acetyl alcohol and one tablespoon of dish soap per gallon of water in place of the soap that we use. Now, I do prefer that you use the soap because this is going to work a heck of a lot better than most of the other methods out there and is definitely my preference for cleaning all components in the grow room, including the walls, light hoods, et cetera. Now, if you're going to be using this solution to be cleaning any sort of electrical components, make sure that you're keeping this as far away from the wiring as possible. You don't want to get it in your wiring. You don't want to get it inside your motors, et cetera. Now, aside from that, it's a super easy way, like I said, to get all your gear clean. If you have any questions or concerns regarding today's segment or would like to set up a consultation appointment, please reach out to us at vermontgrowcoach.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram or contact us directly at 802-342-5381. See you next time. Bloop, 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 bloopers. Plants to use metal blades. And one of the biggest issues with having metal blades, I don't pay attention, and I can just bonk my head at any given time. Oh, oh my God, I forgot the disclaimer. Don't do this shit when it's plugged in. Just don't do it. You get electrocuted. <laughs> so my guess is uh did you get electrocuted in the making of this video no no not not in the making of this video but at one point in time and i actually i had someone else watch the video as i was uh was uh, getting it together this afternoon and they said hey wait a second stoners are going to be watching this you should probably tell them to unplug it first i'm like oh oh tim's gonna kill me <laughs> well i mean it's important it's really important we talk about the cleanliness of the grow rooms right um I, I i i go talk to friends a lot i'm sure we've all seen this we walk in a grow room and it's just there's leaves everywhere there's just stuff everywhere is that important to clean up as well i mean we're talking about cleansing I mean, this year, right? When it, comes, when it comes down to it, the entire room needs to be cleaned on a regular basis if you're going to maintain a clean environment to be able to provide proper medicine. So in my situation, you know, as I started as a caregiver and, you know, I also, you know, just in general, providing uh, this plant for consumption, it needs to be consumed in a healthy manner. It needs to be a clean, healthy product coming mm -hmm. right out of the gate. You know, when it's dried and cured to begin with, before you do any further processing, it has to be a clean product to begin with. So how do you prevent mold issues? How do you prevent pest issues? How do you prevent cat hair and dog hair and all sorts of crap 
from being in your plant, you keep your room clean and you keep the pest issues, the animal issues, et cetera, out. So mm -hmm. another week we'll discuss uh, proper HEPA filters and stuff for uh, intake ventilation. Uh, but for this week, I thought uh, cleaning the fans was, uh, was sufficient to at least get a few people started in the right direction. And then we've got uh, all winter to worry on cleaning the rest of the place. <laughs> <laughs> right and we'll get there we'll talk about another great segment and a, and a lot of fun there um i mean again we especially when it comes to pest and and mildews you keep it clean man keep it clean keep it fresh uh, especially here where we have heat and temperature fluctuations like crazy um bugs man we hate bugs that's the biggest thing bugs right uh but we're kind of winding down to the end of the show here guys and i want to get back to chris really quick um, who, again, man, thank you for spending time with us. Um, I don't know how you find the time to spend with people like us with everything you're doing uh, between the podcast, um, the books, the, the, the shows, the, 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 the pet products, the Zonka bars. I mean, I, I, just the Zonka part alone, I'm, 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 I feel pretty awesome about talking to you with. We barely even touched base on it, right? Now, I mean, obviously, you have a crazy story. You've been through a lot. We talked about other, you know, other people getting released, um, people who have been serving, you know, 40-year bids on three pounds of weed, um, shit like this that's just unfathomable, right? Uh, you know, me and Tim have talked before about people going to jail over ACE um, and shit that we've seen in our lives. It, it's, it's, it's not fun. Um, how can somebody reach out to you, Chris, talk to you, and, and either get involved with what you're doing or help you with what you're doing uh man we, we're all over social media when i'm not in jail i think i got a longer <laughs> parole number on facebook than i do in the state of arizona um but <laughs> if, if you reach out to zonkamiles.org that's our website for the nonprofit, I it'll get to me people will make sure that it gets to me um if nothing else i'm a hard worker and i'm involved with every project that we have going on so it's not something i just start put my name behind and let other people do um mm. that's Donka Miles is probably the easiest way, but then, you know, the, the podcast, HatersMakeMeFamous.com has a website. Um, OGZonka.com has a website. We all have websites that, that lead you to the same place. And I'm the dude. I run it. I own it. Um, I answer it. So um, you can reach out to me anytime. I, that's one thing I like about our company and our, our family. We, we are still who we were 10 years ago before all this went down. and It didn't change us because we won't ever forget where we came from. Well, now with that being said, what kind of advice do you have for people out there in this industry right now? People are coming in, people have been here before. What, what, what advice do you have to share with us? Run! No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, honestly, you know, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, you know, in one yeah. aspect, you're all about free business and enterprise and starting it up, but on the other aspect, you know, just do it correctly, do it right. You know, that the number one thing is to make sure you come out and you do it right. Um, in my, in my opinion, it's more about the integrity you have for your business and for your customers than you do about anything. Like mm -hmm. we wouldn't have survived all this if we weren't coming from a good place, trying to help people. Um, mm -hmm. We would have ended up at the end of the road, just like they wanted us to, or how they made us out. But because we didn't come from that, we've always been about helping people and our brand has always been putting people first. I think that's why we've survived and why we're still here. So my advice is to just come out and be real. If you're here to hustle and you're here to make up a bunch of money off the backs of people who are sick, get the fuck out. Because haters make me famous didn't come about because I'm an egotistical, arrogant person. It's because nobody knew who I was before this whole thing happened. And now that they do, I'm going to make sure everyone understands that this is where we came from and the people that we are. We're not about pointing fingers at good people, but we are about calling it how we see it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we would have survived this if we didn't have the experience and the education behind us to step up and stand up. Um, but not many people do. Not many people have that luxury of growing up on the street as a kid and having a little bit of smarts behind them, you know? So I, I completely got lucky. Um, that's why we offer the resources that we do. That's why we put together the team we have because we know what it's like to be in a position to not have that help or, or a resource to ask for. So um, my advice really is just, you know, I, I welcome competition and good business and everyone should come in and get involved. But if you're a piece of shit and you're trying to dog somebody, just like what happened to me in my case, get the hell out of here. You're not welcome. <laughs> Point blank. 
Right. Unfortunately, we see that way too much in this industry and many industries. It's just, you know, some people are here for the short, quick money grab, but some people are here to help patients and some people are here to create a business that they can keep a family and feed their family and leave to their kids. Right. I mean, it's no different than any other industry, which we all just ask everybody to play the, play the right way. But for that, we need some federal legalization. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we'll see it this year we don't know like like tim was saying earlier a lot of it rides on the way our our senate goes i mean we're, we're getting the bills to the senate it just can't get by the senate guys so i mean we see bipartisan support uh in congress and in lower levels of, of government which is amazing um we're seeing people coming together and, and really all across both lines it doesn't really matter what what side you're on everybody's having their own opinion and they're working together or not uh, but it's the Senate. We gotta get we gotta get this through. The Safe Banking Act's gotta get through, the more acts, we gotta get these things through for what happened the other night, uh passing the stimulus without any sort of uh mentions for anything cannabis is bullshit to and to, to me and anybody in this industry should 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 take a little bit to it. I'm sorry, I, I gotta say it should be done on its own. It shouldn't need to be tacked on to a must pass spending bill. Exactly. Government's supposed exactly. to work. Don't hide bills and bills and this and that. That's it. This is the problem. You vote on an issue. Right. This is it. Legalized. Protect, you know, give people the support they need, COVID, but keep things separate so people know Correct. what's going on. When you start right. filling these bills with all this crap, 5,530 pages of that bill, you think any of those legislators actually read that? They were given 20 minutes in a summary. Like, you know, and that's the, t I just personally, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. This is why I think that we are fundamentally broken in our, we just had a right. senator who was talking about the three branches of government being the House, the Senate, and the executive branch. You know, this is a sitting senator. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm done. <laughs> it's just, we, we need a lot of work, and I don't even know where to start. Maybe Chris, I didn't maybe, graduate maybe high school. Is, man, we, our system is broken. Well, yeah. and I didn't Hopefully, graduate high school. and went to we'll six yeah, years well, in prison, well. and I knew that. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> what? Well, I mean, it, it's... Yes, the, the our political system is a, sh a sham. I hopefully this last few years. <laughs> oh man, uh, hopefully the cannabis issue shows people. I mean, we I think one of the best parts is we've seen the true light of a lot of people in the recent years. You know what I mean? It's kind of like what what Chris was saying. You know what I mean? Be real, be be true to yourself. Uh, we've seen a lot of people ride both sides. We've seen a lot of people take advantage of different situations. We've seen people try to utilize other people to gain their own political or, you know, community upper hand. You know what I mean? Uh, I whether no, Joe. The good thing here is that we see the community. We see people supporting this. <laughs> The people on the ground, 60%, 65% constantly supporting adult use, 90% supporting medical marijuana. The people that are holding this up are, yes, they're the ones in power, but they don't speak for the people. The people yeah. care. The people are moving. That's why this grassroots state level movement is just unstoppable. That will carry on. And yes, Chris, a lot of these legalization schemes start out horrible, but it is a first step. And now we can work on making them better. And well, we're getting expungements. And, less and I agree watching. with you. I think it's got to start we somewhere. Done. It's not perfect. You know, and I understand. It's I saw a double edged sword. We need to also be able to accept them when they change their mind. You know, if mm -hmm. someone that's been anti and against this long, we can't sit here and keep holding them accountable this much longer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We, we right. have got right. to stay on task. We've got to stay and allow them to change their mind. If they've yeah. changed their mind and realized, like, whoops, I made a mistake, we've got to welcome that. I think too many times activists on this side of the road sit here and go, nope, you were on that side. You got to stay got, there. You got beat down for so up. long. It's like, you know, you're absolutely right. That's a really mature right. way to look at it, man. And that needs we'll that. Them, we need to move past it. We need to move we'll past the conflict. And we ask them to be open-minded with our situations and to be open-minded with the use of cannabis. But then again, when they use their mind or they have, just like what we said, we talk about a lot, we have somebody that impacts our lives, whether it's the nun, a parent, a child, a friend, somebody in cannabis that really, really changes your mind. You know, again, that's why I love the industry because this is an open arm industry, but I can hear what Chris is saying. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're literally battling with somebody for years and all of a sudden they go, Hey, can't beat them. Might as well join them. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, it's a tough pill to swallow. It's like, uh, it, it, you know, Chris, I've talked to people who've been incarcerated and we're at events and the cop that arrested him and threw him in prison for five or six years walks by him because he's getting paid triple time to, to enforce the event. And you're going, how fucking ironic is that, right? I'm going home. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> right? staying at that event. I'm out of there. <laughs> 
No, it's just it's it's how it is though. But like you said though, there has to be like as much as I say that there has to be uh, an open mindedness to acceptance of of them being open minded to come to an event that where they used to arrest people for years and show support. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think we've seen a lot of police, doctors, a lot of these you know industries that have been literally pulling the strings for years on drug war um, start to, to take a shift. You know what I mean? We're yeah. seeing cops are, are, that want to use cannabis because of their PTSD, right? Uh, oh. We're seeing doctors that want to utilize cannabis because they're sick of seeing their patients dying because of their own opioids, right? Um, it, 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 it's a mess, man, but hopefully we'll get it straightened out. As long as we keep talking about it, keep sharing our stories, keep making your books, writing your documentaries, and helping the people that need help, man. That's that's what we have to do right now. So I appreciate everything you've done. Your story is truly amazing, man. For a week of research, I'm still having fully caught up with it all. Uh, the Zonka bars, uh, convicted creations, paw putties, right? Um, and, it, and the list keeps going, man. But truly, uh, a true inspiration for us. We're all about inspiration and trying to 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 open minds up for people because i mean dude i can't tell you how many people i know that legitimately walked in the shoes that you walked in in that story like i'm watching i'm going dude this is me and my five homeboys back back home you know i mean we just for us it's like you said it's 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 the luck of the draw right you know what i mean like you're one joint away you know what i mean and that's a that's a sad thing to think about if, if you were thinking about what it used to be in this country and what it pretty much still is but hopefully in the future you know, we don't have this anymore. Um, Chris, again, thank you for your time. Thomas, you. Timothy, Sherry, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, no matter what you're celebrating or what race you come from or what continent or planet or, or corner of the world you come from, guys. I think we all need to spark one up, enjoy the holiday seasons, and uh, look forward to 2020. And uh, let's beat this Rona thing, man. Absolutely. Merry Christmas, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank All you, right, Chris. Thanks for being here, man. Merry Christmas, week, everybody. Real nice to meet you. Next week, we're going to continue the uh, the incarceration theme with uh, OG Eddie Lepp. So Eddie Lepp is going to be on the show as well to tell us his story. Oh, yeah. Um, we yeah. just bought some art. We just bought some of his artwork, which we'll be hosting on our um, inmate. I have a, a wall here on the inside of my retail store in Phoenix that's a inmate art wall where we sell hobby craft and artwork and all the money goes back onto the books of the inmates well we bought his artwork to help support his fight with cancer yes. and uh, you know everything else he's got going on and we're gonna host his artwork here on our wall too Chris link that link up with me this week on that because we're gonna be getting him on the show next next week guys uh, yeah. people don't really realize Eddie's in in some serious health um, oh bad 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 he's trying to buy a trailer right now just so he can live in something instead of driving two hours one way to get chemo and, and treatment yep. so yeah he he's he needs help uh right now and i mean he's, he's an og in the industry that you know a lot of us wouldn't be here without his help or or and, and, and there's neat things about him like he was the last inmate to use glitter in prison like you know so, <laughs> so we're gonna have glitter artwork on my wall that was made by the last guy to ever use glitter in the system so to me that's historical and, and honestly i just love old dudes like it, there, those are stories you're never gonna get told again you're not gonna hear that stuff again so i don't know i have a soft spot in my heart because those are the dudes i took care of inside and uh, i'll do it yeah. And, Eddie, and Eddie's an amazing guy, man. He's, he has a great story. He he went to prison for helping out patients, man. Literally, legitimately stuck his nose up by California, helped write the propositions, helped get the signatures, and then said, fuck you, and served time for it, guys. So he'll be on. Hopefully, we're going to keep our fingers crossed as health stays and continues to be good. Uh, and he makes it into this new year, guys. But we'll have him on next week. Uh, and then we just, uh, Mendo Dope. Guys, first show of the year, we're going to have Mendo Dope on. If you guys don't know who Mendo Dope is, YouTube those guys. Uh, they've been doing some of the best songs for years, and if you you, you just need to know because uh, they were great friends with uh, good friends of ours, Sub Cool. They got songs written with Sub Cool, and they got an album coming out this year, guys. After a few years off, uh, 420, they're dropping a new album. They're gonna be on next next year to uh, yeah, next year. Sounds weird to discuss all this new upcoming stuff, and uh, that's where we're at. It's coming in full. Chris, again, thank you, man. Uh, the video that I've been trying to upload for four hours today is finally up on uh, up on Facebook. So if anybody wants to see the intro to today's show after the show, go check <laughs> it on Facebook. Uh, all as soon our, as I get uh, out of jail. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, Facebook is just hating on everybody in the campus industry lately. Uh, so we want to give a shout out to all you guys. We know we're all struggling. Stay strong. Don't go anywhere. Just keep fighting the power. 
Fuck Facebook. We're going to find other options um, and meet us on the masters of cannabis.org and the we too will be there as well. So guys, don't go anywhere. We'll see you next week. Peace.